I'd like to call the meeting to order, Malibu City Council, regular meeting, October 14th, 2019. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Mullen? Here. Councilmember Peek? Here. Councilmember Wagner? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Here. Mayor Farrer? Here. Do you have a quorum? Okay. Uh, Hans Letts, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? May I have approve an approval of the agenda, please? I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on October 3rd, 2019. Thank you. Excuse me, we now have ceremonial presentations. I have a city tile to present to Doug Clevenger, Senior Code Enforcement Officer, for seven years of service to the city. Doug, would you please join me at the podium? Sorry, is this on? Okay. Doug Clevenger joined the planning department on Octo in October of 2012 as a code enforcement officer. With his law enforcement background, he brought valuable structure and consistency to the code enforcement program. He now leads the city's team of two other officers to ensure city codes and laws are enforced and public health, safety, and welfare are protected. Doug's people skills have been critical to his success. He is able to diffuse volatile situations and more often than not gain voluntary compliance. Applicants and property owners alike appreciate his practicality, professionalism, and his primary goal of finding solutions. They also know that he will follow up and use all available tools to get violations abated. This determination has earned him a reputation for firmness and fairness that fosters cooperation. 
More often than not, people go into meetings with Doug angry and leave smiling because they walk out with a reasonable path for resolving their issues. Doug has also become a critical go-to person in City Hall. This is probably his own fault because of his customary mantra of I'll handle it. And he does. He goes above and beyond to find creative solutions to problems, whether it's specifically a code enforcement issue or just something that will make the quality of life in the city better. The city thanks Doug for his seven years of service and for the teamwork and friendship he provides at city, his city hall colleagues, and we look forward to many more. Please welcome me in thanking Doug Clevenger. Do we have the tile? <laughs> yes. Can you say a few words? Yeah, please. No, I just, uh, it's, I can't believe it's been seven years. It's been, a, it's been an exciting journey. I've worked for municipalities my entire adult life, and uh, I can say that working for Malibu and, and with the staff and management here, it's, been, it's, it's just been a blessing. It's been very enjoyable. So thank you very much. Hopefully this one doesn't fall out yeah. and break. I think they checked. Let's see here. This. There, that's it. Oh. There is your. There. Oh, thank you. Can we get our picture taken? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Okay. We have another presentation of a city tile to Heather Glazer, our city clerk for seven years of service to the city. And Heather beat me to it. I was going to ask her to please join me at the podium. But of course, she already knew that. Heather was hired as the deputy city clerk on October 15th, 2012, coming to us from the Las Virginas Municipal Water District. She also briefly served as our acting city clerk before she was formally appointed as city, city clerk on August 29th, 2016. Heather achieved the designation of certified municipal clerk from the International Institute of Municipal Clerks in 2015 and continues to work toward her master municipal clerk designation. Heather has overseen one standalone general municipal election, two consolidated special municipal elections, and two consolidated general municipal elections. During her years with the city, Heather has found many opportunities to use new technology to provide the public with better access to the services offered by the city clerk's office, including online scheduling for passport appointments, implementing the city's on-base public records portal to provide the public with 24-7 access to many of the city's digital records, implementing a centralized online public records request system, and coordinating design and implementation of the city's electronic agenda management software. Heather is greatly respected by her coworkers and members of the public and she is always happy to assist anyone looking to become more informed about their local government. On behalf of the community, we want to thank you, Heather, for your seven years of service. And there's your tile. May we take a picture? Speech, speech. Yeah, please say a few words. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I wanted to take a minute and thank my deputy, Kelsey, for being my other half in the city clerk's office. Um, Christy for her wisdom and Reva for giving me the opportunity to be Malibu city clerk and work hard at work worth doing. So thank you. Okay, we will now have a staff update on disaster response and recovery. Richard, Andrew, and Susan, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. I'd like to give you a quick update as to where we are with the rebuild progress for the Planning Department and then Andrew. Uh, will uh, provide details regarding building permits. Currently, we've approved a total of 56 residences that are a like-for-like -like rebuild, so this would be replacing the square footage as is or less. And 93 um, applications have come in where we've replaced the structure in kind but have added 10% to it. And then we have an additional 12 approvals that were issued where these were major changes or something uh, maybe new structures added to the residence, new square footage, or a, it could also be a change in the location of the building on the pad. Currently, for single-family homes, we have 10 that are uh, going through the review process right now, and we've approved a total of 161 single-family residences. I realize that if you add that up, that's a bit higher, or not as high as the numbers on the previous slides, and that's because we've also been um, approving s second units, like for like, or garages, barns, and other accessory type development. That's why the numbers, uh, if you try to add them, yeah, you won't get there. And this details that a bit more. So we have the 161 residences, 24 second units or accessory dwelling units, and then 89 other types of structures. We have been implementing the fee waiver program as approved by the council. Uh, these would be the waiver of fees for projects where it's a like for like rebuild up to 10%. And this includes the planning fees as well as the fees for the various other city agencies and plan check. To date, we've issued around uh, $840,000 worth of waived fees. On to building permits. We have issued 29 building permits to date, and here's the breakdown of what's actually in building plan check where folks are running their plans through the building department as well as other city agencies, environmental health, geology, fire department, um, and public works. We currently have 85 projects that have cleared planning and that are preparing to submit to the city for building plan check, but have not yet done so. And we have 47 projects that are currently in the plan check process uh, being reviewed by all those departments that I just mentioned. Again, 29 building permits issued and we're hoping to get the first homes completed very soon, but um, we have uh, 29 uh, with issued permits and under construction. We have our rebuild coordinator position that is here at City Hall at extension 378, 
and uh, the rebuild coordinator is helping folks who need to put together a plan check application. So that's the magenta number 85. Um, for some folks who don't have experience doing this, uh, our service is helping people combine all the elements that's necessary to get the ball rolling and um, get a complete package so that the process can be completed as soon as possible. That concludes the building safety report. Good evening, Council. So an update on preparedness efforts in the last few weeks. Uh, we conducted our final disaster notification system test in Western Malibu. Uh, we also conducted an emergency operations center training for city staff. Uh, and this staff also included a drill that we did um, in the Big Rock neighborhood to test our ability to alert residents to an emergency situation. And I'm gonna show you a little video of what it looked like. So we now have magnets that we can put on city cars, sirens, bullhorn sirens. Um. This is the city of Malibu. <laughs> we are testing our ability to alert residents in the event of an emergency. If you have questions, please call City Hall. So it went really well. We learned a lot. Um, it was really great, and we were, we plan on doing more because you know people told us that. Uh, they could hear the siren. They had trouble hearing the, the bullhorn, like being able to understand what we were saying. So um, we'll refine our ability to do this. Hopefully we'll never need to do it, but we do want to be prepared to be able to do whatever we need to do if we don't have the first responder resources in town to alert people. And this could also be helpful if we have a power outage and we need to get information out to the neighborhoods. So we're, we're working on it. All right, um, speaking of power outages, so, uh, but first before I get to that, uh, Jerry Vandermillen, our, our uh, fire safety liaison, he's been super busy. He's conducted 28 more home ignition zone assessments since the last time we saw you. He's up to 68 total, so it's pretty impressive. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more to do, but it's a great start. And, we, and I think we're gonna be continuing this for a long time. So then on Tuesday of last week, we were notified by Edison. We got our 48 hour notice of a possible public safety shutoff. It was in Western Malibu, roughly from Point Doom to the city limits. So immediately after that, we also got the red flag weather condition warning, which the two usually go hand in hand. So immediately we started going through our procedures of what we need to do prepare for this. So contacting our agency partners, uh, reaching out to staff to put together, you know, kind of a list of who's available if something should happen so we can put a EOC team together very quickly. Um, contacting uh, Edison, Fire Department, Caltrans, um, trying to get generators from Caltrans to maybe keep the signals, because that was one concern we had. There was quite a few signals between that area and the and in addition to just like an inconvenience if there's no power, if we did have a fire and we needed to evacuate, that was a big concern if we were having trouble with signals. So we wanted to get generators out, so we contacted Caltrans, but we also uh, prepared ourselves because we have a number of portable generators ourselves, so we pulled those out, got those ready to go so that we had something to be able to implement if we needed to. Um, we did a lot of messaging. We put together a lot of standardized messaging we also shared it with our neighboring cities so that we're all kind of putting out the same message and that'd be like, you know, Gora and Hen Hills. We're trying to work together so that we're all saying the same thing. Uh, we also did an audible PSA that we gave to KBU that was playing, just giving people information. Um, we also were prepared to implement our information station program. So we talked to Beaches and Harbors. They agreed to let us put one there. If we needed to put a big sandwich board, we were gonna put it at the entrance to Zuma because um, it seemed like a good location. So that was done. And then also the County Emergency Operations Center, they were on low level activation and requested that we uh, put in situation reports. So I was constantly putting in jurisdictional situation reports to the county system during this. So that was kind of leading up till Thursday when Thursday got really exciting, quite a few fires. There was one early in the day at Mulholland and uh, Las Virginis. So we were monitoring that. And then later in the day, we had the fires breaking out um, in um, the uh, Saddle Ridge fire and also the one in Newberry Park. So we spent a lot of time monitoring. Uh, Jerry went out, boots on the ground, to get eyes on these instances to give us information. 
We then put together a tentative EOC uh, staffing plan, getting ready, you know, because we just, even though they weren't an immediate threat to Malibu, you know, we all know it, it, you never know. The winds could change and suddenly it's in our backyard. So we are preparing for that. And then on Friday, you know, the smoke was so bad here, we activated the CERT team. We pulled out all the N95 masks that we have left from Woolsey Fire. And we began putting those out in, um, you know, at the park here at City Hall, the library and the CERT team went out to uh, markets and just handed them out. So they were a huge help to us, took them to the library. Um, and so that kind of sums up that. I'm trying to think if there's anything else about it. So that was this. I forgot to click the slide. Sorry. <laughs> so got so busy talking. Yeah. So that's all there. And I, you know, we're just so very thankful that uh, nothing came into Malibu, and it was just another good drill getting us in shape. So we're, you know, the more you do it, it's like muscle memory. So it just, we just get faster and better each time we have to plan for this. And again, as always, I encourage people to make sure you're signed up for disaster notifications. Because I just want you to know, part of our public safety power shutoff procedures, one of the first things we did that I forgot to mention is the area, the circuit that was going to be impacted, we sent an Everbridge message directly to those folks. So we have polygons already pre-drawn for each of the eight circuits in the city. So it was very easy to very quickly get a message out to that specific area. And then... Um, for the rest of the community, we just used our general uh, messaging platform, social media and all that. But that is our protocol to use Everbridge to alert the specific neighborhood. So that was done. So it's very important that people get signed up for those alerts to make sure you're getting them. Great. Thank you, Susan. Quick okay. comment. Would that be a quick yeah, comment? Sure. <clears throat> Susan, um, could you remind us that truck that's out front, there's a number of questions asked me in the parking lot. and. Maybe you could give it a quick review. Thank you. Yeah, that uh, we reached out to Verizon, or rather, we reached out to Verizon asking if we could possibly get a uh, a cow. But instead, we got something better. We got a colt. <laughs> so a cow is a cell on wheels. A colt is a a cell on light trailer, which is even bigger and more robust than a cow. So they have agreed to have it uh, stationed here in Malibu through the end of the year. So that's really. A great thing to have. We still have to request it through the official channels because it needs to be documented appropriately, but it's right here in town. We won't have to wait for it to come in from like an hour away from another jurisdiction. Thanks for that update. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Susan. All right. Moving on. Item 2A. We have written and oral communications from the public. So uh, when I call your name, would you please uh, be ready to come to the front uh, to save time? First up, we have Ian Roven, followed by Joel Shulman, who has four minutes with Keon. I see you there. Uh, followed by Keegan Gibbs. Thank you. Hello. Hi, City Council. Nice to see you all. Um, so I, I'm speaking on behalf of the Malibu Chamber of Commerce. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I went to school with Skyler, school with Karen's son. Uh, I've known Mikey for a long time, shopped at Zuma J's, Surf Shack. Rick, I'm sure I've pissed you off at some point. Um, well, that really does add 10 pounds. Uh, anyway, I'm here because I want to talk about the management district plan um, and what it can do for the city. Uh, and I'd like it to be an official agenda item to be considered at a later date. Um, I am a local attorney as well. Um, so when we drafted this management district plan, I made sure that all the, uh, all the legal jargon was in the back. Um, and it's about eight, nine, 10 pages of content. Um, I really think the city should consider this uh, because having grown up here, um, a lot of our visitors are uh, uneducated and they don't know, ex they, and they don't stay long. They come, they. They dump their trash, uh, they abuse the city, and then they leave. They don't spend much money unless they're going to a supermarket. Um, and I would prefer that the visitors come educated, that they come uh, and stay at our establishments, that they shop at our restaurants, that they go to our local stores, that they enjoy what we've enjoyed for so many years. Um, and it's just a, a little sad to see. And I know that your plates are full from the fire, and we've all been reeling from it. 
and I don't want to see the, the City Council stressed out any more than it has to be. However, I feel as though this is so important that I'm willing to put in whatever extra time the City Council needs to prepare this in a way that's the most easiest to digest. I won't chew it for you unless you ask nicely, but um, at any rate, I, I feel like we put together a good document here, our timelines here, um, and it's, it's all been emailed as well. Um, and it's really just about approving those eight pages in the petition. So I, I truly hope that the City Council will consider this. It's a project I've been working on for a, a year after it was handed off to me. Um, and we're, we're looking to do whatever we can to help the local businesses survive this winter, which, um, and I don't know if I can say winter is coming on screen. Is that a, I think that is a violation of something, but winter is coming anyway and the businesses are reeling. Um, uh, one report we, the chamber had, uh, we surveyed our businesses and 50% of them um, say that they, I got peeped at, 50% of them say that they, uh, are, it's gonna take about two years to recover what was lost and about 15 to 20% say that if there isn't some type of change, not drastic, but some type of change, uh, that they're just not gonna be able to survive. Um, and these are places that I've gone to since I was you know, 10 years old and I'd hate to see them go because they've been uh, so instrumental in our city. And they're, they're us, they're our locals. So I think we should find uh, every way we can to take care of them. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Next up is Joel Schulman, followed by Keegan Gibbs, followed by Brian Laspada. Karen, it's like you've been doing this all your life. Um, I'm here to actually follow on to my uh, talk uh, two weeks ago to actually determine a date to put the LCP pesticide amendment on, on the agenda. Uh, what's happened recently, did everyone notice that we found out last week that two mountain lions died of, uh, of rat poisoning? And this is really kind of strange. This is, that's actually the third last uh, in this year. Uh, we had one in August, September, and April. And that's really strange because before that there was like one in 2018 in the summer, one in 2017, and one in 2015. So all of a sudden we have three. So I actually happened to meet uh, Jeff Sikich uh, yesterday of the National Park Service, and I asked him, you know, what's going on? And he was actually sort of irritated. He said, there's nothing new happening. I, I asked him, is it the fire? Did it have to do with the Woolsey fire? And he said, not really. He says, the place is just drowning in rat poison. I mean, he was really pissed uh, and that they're following the mountain lions better than they used to with the, with the collars. So they're just finding more dead poisoned mountain lions. And it, I'm using mountain lions, but it's not just mountain lions. It's, you know, owls, hawks, bobcats, coyotes. And a uh, quote from Seth Riley, our uh, Dr. Seth Riley of the National Park Service and UCLA. Just about every mountain lion we've tested throughout our study has had exposure to these poisons, generally multiple compounds, and often at high levels. So it's, we don't see it every day, but, but that is, that's what's happening. Now, in terms of the history of this LCP amendment, as uh, some of you may remember, it's already been voted on unanimously three times to go forward with this. Uh, most recently, just last March, March 25th, we had real great enthusiasm. Mikey was leading the way. And there was a unanimous vote by consensus, the council, this is from the minutes, by consensus, the council directed staff to bring back an item to discuss banning pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, insecticides in the context of the LCP amendment. So. Uh, that's the third unanimous vote. The first one was in December, uh, brought on by uh, Schuyler, 2014, and then reaffirmed again by Schuyler in May 2018. So I don't, I'm not sure what kind of vote would be needed today that I'm sort of, I'm requesting a date or a date to determine a date or something, but just another vote making it four votes. Um, I, you know, I'm sort of asking, how do you do this? So um, that's, that's my request, and uh, Keegan will follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, next up is Keegan Gibbs, followed by Brian Laspada, followed by Barry Haldeman. I've got a slide presentation for you guys, so. 
Does it show up on here ever or no? Your my slides? No, you just have to look over here. Oh, okay, perfect. All right. So <clears throat> normally when I come up here, I, I sometimes I'm kind of funny, sometimes I'm kind of emotional. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to try to keep my cool as, as, as much as possible. I'm going to try not to cuss, but frankly, I'm really, really angry. Um, Joel and Keon have been working this for five years, right? You guys have voted on this thing multiple times. From my understanding, this thing's getting blocked at the staff level, and particularly Christy. And um, I can't, how do I go to another, another slide? You guys already know all this stuff, right? A rat eats it, goes up to a hawk, goes up to a coyote, bobcats, and it gets passed up the food chain and goes to um, our mountain lions, right? So I don't really need to educate you because you've been educated probably over a dozen times over the last five years. This is what a healthy mountain lion looks like, right? That's what an unhealthy mountain lion looks like. It's called mange. And what happens is they bleed from the inside out. Their organs gush blood. Healthy. That's a dead mountain lion from mange. From rat poison. There's a young mountain lion, year old, and a dead mountain lion, two years old. Christy, I really need you to pay attention here, okay? I, I need you to look at this one right here. Good. No, the screen's right there. I need you to look at this. These are the two mountain lions that have died just since last March. The, sc the screen's on your right. When I asked you after March why, what was going on, you didn't even give me the time of day in, in the hallway. You said you wouldn't understand. It's, it's, a, it's some legal stuff, blah, blah, blah. There's other cities that are doing this, there's no reason why we shouldn't have done this already. These two are perfect examples of us not doing anything. And this looks bad on all you guys for not holding her feet to the fire, every single one of you. And it's, it makes me really pissed off that our local government's completely broken, where we have to go and sit up here and beg for you guys to do something and nothing gets done. You lose all sort of, of respect for this podium, respect for this city and how it works, when this is the right thing to do. So just do it. Three this year. There's a farm in Sarah Retreat that thinks they're doing the right thing with rat poison. They said, it's, it's all organic, it's natural. It's not. It's killing these mountain lions. By making it illegal, you make these businesses aware that they cannot do it. We have a small area, we have a small impact, we have a duty to do that for the mountain lions. That's all I got. Thank you. Next is Brian Laspada, followed by Barry Haldeman, followed by Michael Epstein. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, city and staff. It's my first time speaking before the city council, so I feel humbled to be here. Um, just to introduce myself, I know most of you, but I am a pastor at Calvary Chapel Malibu in West Malibu. We meet in Juan Cabrillo Elementary School. And uh, this is just a side note. Before I state my business, I just want you to let you know that from our faith tradition, we actually have a verse that says, pray for all positions of those in authority, that they would live quiet and peaceable lives. So in the original language, the word all actually means all. So that means all of you. Usually the congregation laughs when I use the word all, but this isn't my congregation, so never mind. My state of business here today is, in addition to serving as a pastor, I also serve as a chaplain for the LA County Sheriff's Department. And with that, I have my unit of operation right here at Lost Hills. So coming up on October 23rd at 10 a.m., we are doing a one-hour um, introduction to our new captain, Captain Matthew Vanderhork. And we are creating a platform for the faith community leaders to meet our new captain, as well as the captain to have an ear of the faith community leaders. And so with that, the captain has asked us to invite all the city council members of all five uh, cities. And so that's what this is. It's a formal invitation to you all to come and join us on October 23rd for one hour. We will have a few brief presentations. One will be on homelessness, and it will just be a little nugget just to let the, let the faith community know 
because it is a big concern for the faith community where our, uh, where our law enforcement stands on it. But we will also have something even more important for faith leaders. We will touch on the idea of faith community security, which is a, which is a big issue, especially in the Jewish community. Um, they are very concerned about just the tide of the times. And so please, please, please come out. All the city councils have been invited. I believe the, the Times will be there, Acorn, Suns, uh, Surfside News, etc. And that's about it. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. You should have a card right here with all the information, and you can RSVP simply by perfect. It's all on there. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Uh, next, Barry Haldeman, followed by Michael Epstein, followed by Lloyd Ahern. Uh, good evening. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank, uh, I, well, first of all, I'm here opposing the amendment of the local coastal plan for the Santa Monica Mountains by L.A. County to allow camping in ESHA areas. Um, and I want to thank the council and in particular uh, our mayor and our mayor pro tem and our uh, former mayor for showing up at the Board of Supervisors and for the council in supporting the position that we that it's a disastrous amendment to the local coastal plan. Um, as many of you know, unfortunately, this uh, the plan was passed with one exception, and that is the um, amazing exception that they thought they might put a ranger to walk through the camping area during high fire days. Previously, there had been no one walking through. We'll see if that makes it back to the Board of Supervisors. But this is a very serious thing, especially in light of all the recent fires, not even just the Woolsey fire. So um, they, they seem to be pushing forward. So, um, but it's not over. There are a lot of things we can do to fight this not the least of which is to object to the Coastal Commission who has to approve it, uh, also to um, consider possible litigation and writing again to the Board of Supervisors who will have to reapprove the rewritten uh, statute. And so um, uh, it, we have given out T-shirts that say no more fires. I want to thank the people who showed up. And we have a Facebook page called Santa Monica Mountains Safe Access Coalition, which we will um, give new information on. And if you want a T-shirt, uh, you can get it through there. Also, I asked Aaron if, if some, of, some of the merchants would uh, be supply stations, which would be great. The other thing I, is very important. I would like to recommend that we have a publicist that the city hires an outside publicist for about five or six months to change the face of Malibu because Sheila Kuehl was very disrespectful to the city and basically said kind of suck it up, access is more important. And uh, I would recommend strongly that we need to change that view of the city. It'll help us in Sacramento with a lot of things. It'll help us with this amendment. And uh, I would be happy to help in finding a publicist because I'm an entertainment lawyer. I deal with them all the time. So uh, again, the fight is not over. And I thank the city council for the position they've taken and really consider let's get a publicist on board to help us change the view of the LA Times and the media. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. OK, Michael Epstein followed by Lloyd Ahern, followed by Paul Grisanti. Good evening, city council, council members, Riva, and uh, everybody in the general public. Michael Epstein, I'm here with my Naka Malibu Triathlon producer's hat today, and really here just to express my thankfulness and gratefulness to everybody, to the community, to the council, to the lifeguards, to the police, to everybody that really, really helped us make the 33rd annual. So it's been 33 years since we started the event. An incredible, incredible success. It was about three weeks ago at Zuma. We had a little under 5,000 people, but most importantly, we raised $1.4 million for pediatric cancer research at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And that money goes to... <laughs> 
And that money goes to benefit the patients and the families that are actually out there in the race. So there's about 100 people whose kids have either lost their battle to cancer, who are fighting cancer as we speak, or are actually in remission. And those families are out there, and this race and the city and the community gives them the energy and the power to really, really, really deal with that incredible and horrible kind of time of their lives. So it's an amazing thing to see. I think it's what gives our event the energy, and obviously after 33 years, gives me the energy to keep doing this and keep me wanting to fight the good fight for everybody. This year, the sheriffs did an incredible job of getting the roads open early. I think we had about an hour and 15 minutes of impact each day, so it's been getting better and better each year. And uh, we could not do the event without you guys. So I'd like to present Reva and each city council member with the finisher's medal from this year's Nautica Malibu Triathlon. So thank you guys. The athletes, the spectators, the celebrities, and most importantly, everybody at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, okay, good evening, uh, City sorry. Council. Lloyd, one, one second. Lloyd yeah. Ahern, followed by Paul Grisanti, followed by Hans Letts. Uh, good evening, City Council. My name is Lloyd Ahern. I want to uh, talk about the uh, September 24th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting that Barry just talked about, and I want to also thank the whole board, uh, the whole Malibu City Council, the whole apparatus, it was unbelievable, the show of force between Karen, Mikey, Jefferson there, and then just the feeling of all of you guys behind us. Um, this this thing is so bizarre, and, if, and, and Karen and Mikey no, and Jefferson know. There was something surreal about it because, uh, you know, if M Los Angeles County, which is if we point straight ahead and walk, straight ahead, we're going to be in Los Angeles County in about three quarters to a mile above us. And uh, in, in eastern Malibu, which is about, you know, is, is a tinderbox, if you just get up into, up into anywhere, up in Tuna, anywhere else like that, if a fire starts in Los Angeles County because of their unsupervised, and at night, for sure, they do not want a supervisor there at night. That's when get, people get drunk, that's when people light fires, that's when all bad things happen at night. It's not gonna hurt them. It's just gonna burn Malibu right to the ground. So these guys aren't, they're, 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 they're gambling on our money. And this is a real, um, and, and Karen and, and Mikey and Jefferson know, there was something odd about the whole thing. When Barry said what he said was, they don't even want a supervisor on a red flag day. And Janice Hahn went, well, that's, you know, like the day when you want a supervisor. And the most pregnant moment you ever saw between Sheila Kuehl and, and regional planning and her planner, they, they didn't know what to do because MRCA, the truth is MRCA does not have the money to supervise this cockamamie idea that they want to do. We are Malibu, ourselves, are in the back seat of a car driven by a drunk driver. We gotta stop this car. We gotta pull that drunk driver out and we all know who the hell that drunk driver is. And we gotta rearrange, renegotiate this thing. We've got time. When I'm on a set and a producer tells me something and the crew's all depressed, I say, the sale starts when the customer says no. They said no, our, our sales are starting right now, and you guys are gonna do it, and I'm, I have total faith. Thanks. Thank you, Lloyd. All right, Paul Grisanti, followed by Hans Letts, and that's uh, all I have for 2A. Greetings to Mayor Fair and the City Council. And I just want to take a moment to recognize something that you received at the beginning of the meeting when they said that there's 29 permits that are currently outstanding. That's four more than last week. You took in five applications last week and you issued four permits. You're almost to the point where you got as many coming out as going in. That's really good news because until you get up to about six a week, you don't stand a chance of people getting a permit in six months. So I'm really pleased with it. I think it's terrific. I think anytime you pass building and safety, 
give them an attaboy or at a girl or thank you very much and really, really, really appreciate it. And I was going to ask, display my ignorance about how to watch this meeting live on, on, uh, online, but Hans straightened me out. So I'm going to go home and watch it on YouTube. Thank you, Paul. The last speaker I have for public comments not on the agenda is Hans Letts. I, too, cover your meetings watching YouTube, sometimes watching other things at the same time. Uh, Mr. Epstein just gave you an award and told you some facts about the marathon that just weren't true. The, the marathon has been here for 33 years, and every year it has gotten bigger. This year, they ran a, a bicycle race from here to Oxnard and back. That not only gummed up Pacific Coast Highway for the first time to the west, but it also meant that the finish lines in Malibu were up much longer because there was a, a long road race in the middle of it. He said the roads were open in an hour and a half. That's not true. At 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon, the day of the marathon, Pacific Coast Highway was still restricted to one lane and was virtually stopped from El Matador Beach to Paradise Cove. The marathon has grown and grown and grown. Nobody wants to endanger the millions of dollars that it raises for the children at Children's Hospital. There is no question that the marathon is a wonderful event that brings people to Zuma Beach, that brings athleticism and esprit de corps and, and good things. And that's not the issue. The issue is the lack of communications. Once again, Malibu Park residents, Malibu West residents, or Broad Beach residents were isolated in their neighborhoods with no accurate times, no accurate directions, and no accurate instructions as to where to wait or how to get through. I stood at the corner of Trancas Canyon Road and watched people risk arrest because they had no idea what to do. They couldn't stop. They couldn't go. They were instructed to just keep driving. People in my neighborhood have never, not once, received a communication from the marathon as to what time the lanes will be closed and what times they'll be open and how to get through. The confusion about being told to go down to Bonsall and try to turn left there, once again this year, we were not allowed to do that. My neighbors were not allowed to turn left there by the deputies directing traffic. This has been a cluster blank getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's time to address it. I'm happy that that many people came here and were able to enjoy the beach, and I am thrilled that $1.6 million was raised for the children who desperately need it. The question must be asked, how much was raised for the organizing company? How much did they make using our public streets. If they're going to use our public streets, then we deserve some accountability on this. And then make the donation to the children. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hans. Okay. Moving on, do we have a city manager update? Yes, good evening, everybody. Nice to see everyone out here. Um, I want to start by um, thanking Doug Clevenger, our uh, senior code enforcement officer. Um, Doug is one of the most helpful people uh, for me and for the city uh, here at City Hall. He is responsive, he is patient, unbelievably patient, and really helpful in dealing with problems that come up in our city. And so um, I think he's one of those people who just embodies what a civil servant is. And so I'm very grateful uh, to the work that he's done. And thank you for being with us for seven years, and I hope we have you for many, many, many more years. And thank you very much to our city clerk, um, Heather Glazer, who is um, always calm and always patient and takes so much time uh, with staff and with the community and members of the public. And uh, we're very lucky to have her, and I'm very lucky to have her on my management team. So. And then my big announcement of the evening is I'd like to announce that Yolanda Bundy is our new Environmental Sustainability Director and Building Official. And she joins us, uh, most recently she was with the City of Ventura where she was their uh, Chief Building Official. She has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, a Master's in Structural Engineering. She's a Certified Building Official and she has multiple Code Council certifications. 
Um, most recently in June, she uh, was awarded the Safer City Building Officer of the Year. Um, and I'm really very happy to have her join Malibu and be a part of our community. Um, she uh, was with the city of Ventura after the Thomas fire and helped them in their rebuilding um, of over 500 structures. And so the depth of knowledge and um, the understanding that she has in dealing with the community after a disaster like what we're uh, going through is just invaluable. And so I'd like to invite Yolanda up to say a couple of words, and I hope uh, you all will take the time to come meet her and give her a warm welcome at City Hall. Good evening, City Council. It is an honor to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I am humbled by this opportunity, and I'm fully committed to help the public and council members and city manager. Thank you. And then just two quick um, announcements. On October 24th, we're going to be having a screening of the Johnny Strange film, Johnny Strange Born to Fly, and that will be here at City Hall October 24th at 7.30. Um, there's only about 30 spaces left, so please uh, register for that if that's something you're interested in attending. Um, and then we also have a survey open on the city's website for the temporary skate park. Um, to put in your opinion on a couple of the options, and that is open until Friday, October 18th, and that's available on the city's website, malibucity.org. Um, and then I'm going to echo what I do every council meeting, what Susan did. Please sign up for alerts. Please register with Everbridge and make sure that you have a way uh, to hear what's going on when there's a disaster, particularly as we are now uh, in the depths of fire season. So thank you. Can I ask, could you tell us what's going on on uh, November 9th a little bit? Oh, certainly. Um, I apologize. I actually meant to do that. So on November 9th, um, the council will, um, the council, the community will be recognizing uh, the one-year anniversary of the Woolsey Fire. November 9th is the day that it hit Malibu, even though the fire did start the day before. And we're going to be having a community event at Zuma Beach. Um, it's uh, not doing any dignitaries, no speeches, nothing like that. We're going to have um, a few speakers from our volunteers on patrol and our CERT program. Uh, we have uh, Brandon Jenner performing and the Malibu High School Choir. And we're also doing a tree sapling giveaway for Malibu residents and a, a crank radio and AM radio for Malibu residents as well. So um, I hope everybody will come out and uh, mark that day. Um, and hopefully start a better year all together. Thank you. Thank you, Reva. Okay, next up we have our City Council Subcommittee reports. Who would like to give their council report first? I'll start then. And uh, okay, um, next week I have the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission meeting. I'll give you an update at the following council meeting. Uh, Skyler and I had our environmental sustainability meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock, and prior to that we had our Zeracis meeting at 3 o'clock. Uh, information from both of those meetings will be coming forward to the council at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Who'd like to go next? Mikey, thank you. Um, okay. It feels like it's been a while. we got an extra week off, and it feels like vacation or something. It's kind of odd. So a lot going on. Um, I think this last wind event was pretty traumatizing for a lot of people. It certainly was at my end of town. Um, as part of Arson Watch, I did four different patrols up there, um, and there was a record turnout for Arson Watch patrols, so uh, I think that went really well. I know they were right on scene when that fire broke out at a Mulholland and Las Virginis. Um, saw a photo right as it was announced. I know too that people are really grateful to see that response and just know that people are up there and trying to be aware and um, I don't know, it was good. So if you um, want to do something to help, consider Arson Watch. Obviously, Karen and I and Jefferson um, went to the county meeting on camping in Esha. I'll let Karen speak about it. I'll, just, I'll go with the word surreal. I'll, I'll just go with that. I'm just going to end with surreal. Um, 
I think one of the issues that we hope to get more light on in town that we had a meeting on was the homeless working group in Malibu. And what I see happening every time at that meeting, which is understandable, some residents show up and they're really angry and they're really frustrated and they really don't understand why the city isn't doing more and why is nothing happening. It, it, it's fully justified. And by the end of the meeting, they're quietly slumped over after sort of starting to understand what an overwhelming situation is on so many levels. So I'm hoping and talking with Susan in particular, uh, we want to do some sort of, and we don't have it defined yet, we haven't got there, a, a public forum to really address it citywide. And just so people can understand what we're up against and what our options are and what else we can do. Um, and we are doing things, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's, like, it's like rising sea levels. It's, it's, not, it's not, we're not making a big dent in it right now, and it's frustrating for everyone involved, from the sheriff to, to our, uh, our team um, in the field to just the community to everyone. It's a really frustrating thing. So anyhow, I, I, I hope to see that coming forward. I'm also, as you may have heard me say, I'm a co-chair of the Homeless and Steering Committee in Santa Monica. And we did an event Saturday where we built, just volunteers showing up, we built 1,200 hygiene kits. And that are, those are kits that we allow a group called uh, the West Coast Care, an amazing man named Ron Hooks. He uses them as a tool to engage the homeless and then create a relationship and start the process of transitioning them off the streets. And he has incredible success in Santa Monica. He's an amazing man. And um, I just want to share that. So there are things that, that we can do that start to move the needle, but it's hard and it, and it takes time. And programs like what Ron does and what our committee supports um, do make a difference. And they also do something else. They get the public involved. And so just sitting on the sidelines frustrated and confused and pissed off and scared now you can show up at an event like that and, and start to be educated and, and actually do something that really does change lives. And Ron's gotten over 300 people off the street this year. And he'll tell you, it's one person at a time. It's not something you can just do in a big group setting. It doesn't work that way. Um, proud to say that our Malibu West Volunteer Fire Brigade, we got our repeater installed. Um, and we're having radio training, so we will actually be able to communicate in a disaster when there's no power. That would be a very unique experience for us. <laughs> I also uh, attended uh, part of a meeting at Point Doom that was put on with their volunteers. Very well done, very impressive. Uh, if you're a resident anywhere near that, you should be really proud of what Keegan and his group are doing over there. Um, super well put together. Um, also, I'm gonna, this is going to dovetail into something else, but I went to uh, the Reader's Choice Award. Surfside News does that, and it was at a Christie's restaurant, just recognizing local restaurants that different people voted on. And what a great event. I just, I'm, if you know anything about me, you know I'm really a big supporter of local business. And local business, as Ian said, has taken a huge hit from this fire and is difficult anyhow in Malibu. It's a very, very difficult proposition to have a, a business. And a lot of us love our local businesses. But yet, it's much harder to survive than I think most people realize. So I think that event was great. And I really would like to ask the council to, uh, for consensus to agendize, uh, bringing forward what Ian was talking about, the tourism, the, the TID. Improvement District, it's a, a really good plan that's a marketing plan that allows those businesses in the off season when things are slow to market for people to come spend money in our neighborhood and, and businesses in Malibu, if you, if you go ask them, they're desperate for that to happen, especially in the off season. So it's a really big deal. So I would love to get consensus even if we need to push it a little bit or whatever we need to do to bring that back and at least look at it and talk about it. Um, don't know if anyone here is pro bring it back. business. Bring back an item on it. Let's have a discussion. 
I'd like to, I just wanted to make sure I had consensus. I don't want to bring something forward that no one gives a darn about, but I do. Um, all right, well, we got three of us nodding yes at least. Um, can we just, should we, do we set a date or do we discuss a date later? I know it's not on the work plan, so I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of the challenges. Um, I'll come I want up to help with a date with... if you don't mind. I don't want to pick a date uh, without looking at the schedule and making sure that we can adequately get it on. Okay. We have a couple and it's a process for up. that to go through, as you know. Sure. And it does impact the city. The city's reimbursed for some of its time, but still, people are people and they don't magically appear to do things. I understand. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, and last night I was at the community fire meeting for Corral Canyon. Um, a few couple other faces were there too. Really well attended, excellent event. Corral Canyon is a great example of a proactive community um, that's doing a lot to be prepared for for fires and other disasters. Um, so excellent event there. And then this week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, Karen and I believe Rick and I will be down at League of Cities, which is an uh, event of all the local cities that are part of that group, which is most, and a great opportunity for us to not only connect with people, but to push our agendas forward as um, a number of speakers brought up issues that would definitely be subjects of discussion. So, um, and I th think, I think, oh, quickly, Doug, Heather, excellent, thank you so much. And just a little little known fact, if you ever run for city council, you get to be r really close with Heather because without her, you have no chance. You just, <laughs> you have no idea what you're doing <laughs> and you're blundering around in the dark and she is amazing and fantastic. Now, of course, Doug, when you meet him, you're just hoping he doesn't come to your house and find all the stuff you've done. So it's a totally different thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's my neighbors that did stop me. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, and Yolanda, uh, I'm so excited that you're here. Um, it was excellent, excellent to meet you a couple weeks ago, and uh, thank you very much. Um, Skyler, Rick. I'll go. Yolanda, welcome to the team. Uh, it's Unbelievable that we're lucky enough to get somebody with your background and um, experience and a master's degree in engineering. Oh, my God. Thank you very much for being willing to uh, come over to the city of Malibu, and I hope that you have a wonderful time here, and we really look forward to working with you. So thanks for joining the team. Doug, congratulations. Thanks for all the hard work you do. I know if you came to my door, I would just say, yes, sir, and I don't think... Uh, Anybody else have a problem with that either? So thanks for all the hard work that you do. I know code enforcement is one of the more challenging um, things to do and still leave people smiling. So uh, thanks for doing that. I appreciate that. And Heather, thanks for holding uh, my hand through the whole process of being the mayor and spoon feeding me all the stuff when I was there, uh, as well as all the other challenges that we've encountered through the time uh, since I've been here. So thank you for all the professionalism. Sincerely appreciate it. I did go along with Karen and Christ, not Christy, you weren't there, to the uh, LACO uh, meeting with Christine and, uh, and LaTanya and Reva was there too. And L the LACO board is the board that we are applying to do our separation from the um, getting Malibu having its own school district and separating from the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. And although we weren't really the main item up there, there was a sort of landmark case that was there. And um, we learned a lot and it was a very educational experience. I'm glad I went down there. And uh, it gives me new optimism actually for the whole challenge that lies ahead. It was really good. That's the only uh, you know, professional city council thing that I did, I think, uh, of note since the last meeting that we had. Um, Joel, make a good point on the rodenticide thing. If we could get some read on when that's coming back from Riva, maybe, and give, us, give them some hope out there. They have worked hard diligently. I uh, agree with them, um, unless there's some major impediment to doing this or it costs a lot of money. Um, in the era of belt tightening, let's let's get you on the road. 
And so if we could get some comment on that at the end of our comments, that would be wonderful. Barry Haldeman, I appreciate your passion for the subject, and I think that your idea of change the view of Malibu is a sound one. And actually, I've been saying that uh, for years. And this, this whole concept of people portraying Malibu as being elitist and exclusive and we don't want people here is just BS. And as I always say, at every opportunity, whether I'm in Sacramento or here, uh, 15 million visitors in a small town of 13,000, that's a uh, record that's unmatched on planet Earth, and it's the best. We welcome more visitors than anyone per capita in the United States of America, I believe. I think that's probably true, and we need to extol that. You're right. I don't know if we necessarily need to spend any more hiring and more money hiring an outside firm, but maybe that's a challenge that we could do, and all of us, when we go representing the city of Malibu, whether it's at the League of California or up in uh, Sacramento or at the Board of Supervisors, we need to hammer that point home. We need to hammer it home, and it needs to be part of our um, message because we are the world champions, and we work in conjunction with other public safety agencies. We work with the, with the County of Los Angeles, and we're the champs, and we need to get that out there. So I agree with you, but I don't necessarily think we should spend more money on doing that. I think we can probably handle it from within, but it's a good message, and I appreciate you driving the point home, and it is a little disconcerting when you go down there and everyone kind of brushes you off like, ah, oh, yeah, those guys from Malibu, come on. Hey, they don't have that many visitors in those other towns. They just don't. I was, uh, I'll bring up one item that's fire safety related in from my other job. I was working at Station 71 the other day when the um, Saddle Ridge fire kicked off, and the other one too, and the smoke just kind of blanketed the town of Malibu and made everyone's anxiety level go up. I must have, everyone has Station 71's phone number for some reason, so I must have fielded 50 phone calls, which was right next to my bed, and it was just automatically, it's like, oh, I'm in Corral Canyon, and I smell smoke. So my standard answer was, do you have a television? Yes. Turn it on. Turn to channel five. You'll get live mini cam coverage. So if you find yourself in that position, it's kind of a funny story, but the reality is you'll get better information from the news if there's a real no kidding fire going on usually. Um, so try that first before you call the fire station, because if there is a big fire going on, oftentimes the smoke will come down range and, and we'll uh, see it. Now, if you see flames, then pick, don't call the station, just dial 911. Okay, that's all I got. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rick. Skyler. Thank you, Karen. Um, uh, second what everyone else said. Um, Doug, thank you for your service to Malibu. I know sometimes you have to kind of act like Switzerland <laughs> or get some sort of a resolution from things that are quite difficult, and you've proven to do a very good job of that. Uh, Heather, it's been a pleasure working with you and having you as our city clerk and assistant city clerk prior to that. So thank you very much. Um, and Yolanda, welcome. Um, as Jefferson mentioned, we had a Zeracis meeting earlier today and an environmental subcommittee uh, meeting. There'll be some things coming forward on that, uh, one in regards to some more fireproof uh, landscaping, uh, maybe some things that we'll be preventing or not. Um, we'll have that discussion up here under the Planning Commission. Um, in the near future. Um, Joel and Keegan, thank you for speaking. Christy, where are we at with banning the use of anticoagulant rodenticides? Good evening, Ms. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, well, first let me just say that anticoagulant rodenticides are gruesome and they result in an absolute inhumane death and their use isn't limited to their target and they affect the whole ecosystem and we know that and um, I have no doubt in my mind about it. Um, and secondly, of course, as you know, I don't set agenda items so I don't have it, let me, you're not looking at the problem. Um, but um, at the same, well, also let me say one more thing, which is that, you know, it's always unnerving to me when people who are on the same side start attacking each other. I just, I, it's not productive and it doesn't, it, it doesn't end up um, addressing the real issues. What we have done in terms of the rodenticides, besides 
learning a lot about them um, is we have stopped their use completely on city property, which is something that was in our control. Um, we have uh, twice called for the um, private businesses and homes not to use them and uh, launched education campaigns on that. Um, we have made a policy that we don't contract with any business that uses them, so there, nobody who uses those would get a city contract. Um, and more in, in a bigger way, um, we used um, the city's position on the League of California Cities Environmental Quality Control Committee, which was then held by Laura Rosenthal, to um, begin a campaign of education that resulted in um, getting, and, and don't think these, these things come easily because there's a lot of work that goes on and not all cities agree on things, but to get that committee to represent to the, or to recommend to the full league um, a change in the state law that preempts cities from regulating pesticides, which would free the cities up to, um, to ban them locally, but more importantly, to push the state to ban them statewide, because that's really the issue when it comes right down to it. Um, you know, critters don't know when they've meandered in or out of the coastal zone, and so it, it's going to take a statewide ban to have the ultimate impact. And with that, armed with that um, resolution from the League of California Cities, the city has continued to engage its legislative lobbyists who um, finally got some traction in the last year toward getting a bill that would um, assist in this. It went through the process. We got um, pretty far along, and it was ultimately, I believe, made into a two-year bill. So we are still fighting the fight. And ultimately, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, um, that's the solution because until they're banned statewide, you know, we, you um, have a kind of a piecemeal control. Our issue locally um, is with Food and Agricultural Code Section 11501.1, which very explicitly says that um, the uh, registration, sale, transportation, and use of pesticides are a matter of statewide concern to the exclusion of all local regulation. And it charges the director of the um, state agency with um, enforcing that against cities um, in a, a directive way. The director shall maintain an action, shall if there is um, a violation of this. And so we know that at least for non-coastal cities that that's not an option, and if what we're trying to do is, you know, get rid of this garbage, um, we're going to uh, need to address that code section. Their uh, theory has been um, promoted that the Coastal Act allows something beyond local regulation. That would be a departure from our usual interpretation of the Coastal Act. As you know, we've kind of fought for a long time to keep local control on that. Um, <laughs> But it's a possibility, we'll see. There was a case called Mountain Lands Conservancy um, versus the Coastal Commission where a trial court had uh, ruled in, in favor of the Coastal Commission, expanding the Coastal Commission's authority. That case is now on appeal, so the trial court decision is of no use to anybody, not even the litigants at this point, but it's up on appeal and maybe on appeal uh, we'll get a definitive answer from that, so that's also going. So we've got the two-year bill, we've got that case going. And then, um, what else is, I um, think that's it. Um, so that's. So at this time we can't uh, pass a law or an ordinance that would ban the use in the city of Malibu. So, that's wrong, that's wrong. Other cities are doing it, no. Keegan and Joel, please. Be quiet. I hear you. Okay, and I'm aware uh, of that. As if you you're going to speak, you're going to have to come up to the podium. I don't think it's Joel. Please have a seat. Joel, I'm sorry. Everybody's had their allotted time. Our community is very passionate, as you know, about banning <laughs> the use of these items. Mm -hmm. And the way that I understand it from you is that there's this 
preemption issue with state law. And yes, I very much understand how much the city has fought for local control, and we don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize that. If you think this jeopardizes that, I don't want to do it. But I hear from so many people in our community, and then we have this reoccurring disheartening footage that shows up online or is real, and we have animals that are dying, or predatory animals that are dying regularly in our backyard as a result of this. So it puts us in a lame situation because we want to do exactly what Joel and Keegan and many others in this community have referenced. Um, but yet every single day, there's commercial pest operators coming into this city and, you know, probably thousands of our, probably, you know, one out of four homeowners in this community that have these anticoagulant rodenticides distributed all over their properties in areas that are adjacent to ESHA and elsewhere, and it's spilling over into our wildlife. Right. So let me say two things. The first is um, I remembered the other thing that we've got going on, which is um, I've been in contact with the general counsel for the state agency that regulates trying to remove that barrier since that the code specifically gives some authority there. I'm trying to work with them to get around that. So that's another possibility. We'll, we'll hopefully that'll pan out. But in the end, what is going to, passing a uh, ordinance doesn't do the trick. It's enforcing the ordinance that that will have the impact. And nobody has enforced this, not the county of Los Angeles has never enforced it. There's been no enforcement of it. And that's, that's kind of where the important step goes, where we actually get rid of it. And that's why I think it's a good idea either to get the state agency on board, which I'm working on, or get the state law changed, which would be the most effective, so that when we do enforce it, if we adopt something, and we can't get easily thrown out of court on, a, you know, a very obvious legal or spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars fighting in court over, you know, the language of an ordinance rather than, you know, putting our money toward banning this. I mean, that's the concern is that we're just buying, you know, legal arguments and we're not helping the environment. I had a quick question for you, if you don't mind. Um, so, did the county of Los Angeles ban this, essentially? Yeah, essentially in the LCP, but they haven't enforced it. That's the, I mean, that's the issue. Hey, please, a little noise, discipline, you know, order. Right, well, I mean, was, we, we need to figure out, you know, how to remove them where they're being used. That when somebody, we want a, a situation where somebody could seize one of those traps, can call the code enforcement officer and say, you know, cite them or well, get them I, I get removed. that. I, you know, that's, that's true for any, you know, rule that we have in the city enforcement. Um, but they, so what the county passed is the same thing that we're wanting to pass and have they been sued? That lawsuit that came down, that's what we're waiting on. That's pending in the Court of Appeal. The, answer is no. the county of Los Angeles was sued? That's... No, it was the... Joel, please, just control I mean, yourself. There's, there's, there, there, the Mountain Lands Conservancy litigation is looking at that, uh, that issue about whether or not the... Um, Joel, please, are... control yourself. But you know what, maybe we've gone too far on this thing. So, if, I mean, I, again, I don't control agendas, so... Well, no, I mean, look, like, I was asking for an update and seeing on where it's at. It's obviously a passionate issue, and it's something that's frustrating for me that we even have to talk about it anymore at this point. It seems like it's been, I think, six years. Um, so I just hope that we can, you know, put some, put the pedal to the metal on, you know, getting something to come out of the state where it is enforceable. Um, if at this point it, it does not make you know, practical sense for us to enforce a law that, or to pass a law that we cannot enforce. I very much understand that and I'm actually against that. But I would li love to see something, you know, or some more resources of the city maybe be, be spent on, you know, furthering that um, at the state level. 
So thank you for the update on that. And uh, Barry, you still here? Yes, um, Barry and Lloyd, thank you for bringing up this, this stuff with the um, the camping and whatnot. And as others said, the, the little smoke layer that rested over Malibu from the, the fire out in the valley is definitely a reminder um, of how prepared everybody needs to be and that we do not need to have camping any further in the Santa Monica Mountains. So hopefully um, we can get to some sort of a resolution that would be different than what the county did, although I don't see that happening at this time. It's very frustrating. So thank you. Okay, Mikey has one more item to add to his report. Yeah, I, um, I did want to speak on the pesticide issue tonight. I was too emotional to start with it, then I forgot it at the end. So I have spent quite a bit of time with Christy on this issue. We have, including tonight, that's why I walked in late, because we were talking about it again. I, I would suggest at this point that we do agendize it and have be able to have a full conversation on it and go into the details. I mean, I, I just think it's too important. There's too much damage being done. And I'm, I'm hopeful there's actually been very recent communication from people at Department of Pesticide Regulation. There's, there's been potentially good news, but I think we should agendize it and talk about it because the cure, if our any action we take isn't accepted by the Department of Pesticide Regulation, is that we could, of course, remove it. So there is there is a way out, but at some point we have to make a stand. And but I think we should have an intelligent conversation on an agendized item on it, and that's what I would suggest. And see if I can get some consent on that. So we agendize for a fourth time a vote and a consideration. <laughs> well, I'm um, asking to bring it back and and have an item that we can decide to move forward with or have an intelligent conversation and not move forward with it, but actually get to the point where we're going to have that conversation as opposed to where we've been, which is not having that conversation and talking about agendizing it. So let's agendize it, and if it's the bad idea, let's not do it. And if it's the right idea, let's do it. But let's at least have that meeting and and have an adult conversation, bring the community out and bring experts out or whoever we can bring out and have this talk instead of sitting here frustrated and not taking, not, not getting to that level. I, I, it's not that I'm opposed to having the conversation again. I don't think that there's any disagreement among us as to whether or not it's bad for the environment, it's bad for our wildlife. I don't, I, I've just... I, we're sort of conflicted in this legal realm, you know, and that's where when if something's getting appealed That we need to wait to see where the cards fly on that decision But I, if, I'm gonna jump in here because I'm feeling like we're getting too far down the discussion with this And I will find a date for it to come back and you all can discuss it openly Okay, thank you All right, I'd like, can I add one more comment because yeah, I course. didn't really make a personal comment on anything I just wanted to thank Joel, Keegan, and Kean um, for bringing this up and continuing to bring it up. It, it needs to be forced. I don't have a problem with it. Um, we should have passed this a long time ago. I have to answer to the people who call and email about Joel and Keon in other cities have had got this passed. Other communities have passed it. And they embarrassingly have to say, well, I'm from Malibu, and we haven't passed ours yet. I share that ill feeling deep down with you, Joel. And I know Keegan's watching tonight. Thank you, Keegan. Right. Okay. Well, we can't see because we're this, these lights are, uh, can't, anyway. Thank you for this. Um, I do my own duty. I see a bait box. I know what to do. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, just want to quickly go through some of our uh, speakers tonight. Ian, I think you've left, but uh, the uh, Tourism Improvement District, yeah. 
Um, hopefully we can improve tourism in the off season. I think we all seem to feel like we have enough during the on season, or at least a lot of people, hopefully they're spending some money. Um, Joel and Keegan, thank you for speaking. And Keon, thank you for all the work you've done. I know it's been years, uh, and this is definitely a, um, a project from the heart for you. Um, I'm, I feel right now like the facts might be in dispute, so that's my first uh, goal, is to get everything clarified. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go down the road uh, with council time or staff time um, unless we're clear on what the facts are. Um, and then, yeah, we, I think we do need to move, obviously move ahead if we can. Um, and if we can't, we got to figure out a way to do it. Uh, you know, Mikey and I happened to be up in Sacramento when Richard Bloom's bill uh, was on the agenda and we got to voice our strong opposition to it. Um, but knowing that it's a two-year bill, I will say if you want to write to your uh, representative, please don't hesitate to do that along with any of us. Um, Brian Lasbada, are you still here? No. Well, um, I really appreciate what he's doing with the Clergy, Clergy Advisory Council. Um, I'll be at that meeting at Lost Hills. I'm hoping as many of us uh, will be there as possible. And yeah, Brian is just an example of somebody who's trying to find solutions, um, not just getting up in arms about the problem. Um, and I will say this, I haven't been to one conference since I got elected where homelessness was not on the agenda as a panel discussion uh, or some kind of item. Um, up for discussion. I, I've heard solutions from other cities. I don't know if I'll call them solutions, um, things that other cities are doing. Some of them don't work here. Um, but yeah, we it's a growing problem. That we can't deny that. And, and we're all seeing it with our own eyes every week. Um, and we need to find workable, empathetic, uh, real solutions. Barry, Lloyd, and anybody else who went down to the county supervisor's meeting, man, um, I will say I wasn't surprised that we got a unanimous vote against our position, but it's very disheartening. And, um, you know, here we are less than a year after the Woolsey fire. Uh, you know, we just got demolished in that fire here. Our city took the hardest hit of any of them, and that completely fell on deaf ears. Uh, and it was framed as the most important thing being public access, as if there weren't any right now, um, as opposed to environmental preservation or public safety. So, you know, we're still working on it. That's all I can say. We're not, we're not uh, going home and giving up on that one. Um, Hans, are you here? No. Um, I also realized that um, the Malibu Triathlon is a great charity event. Um, as Michael said, raising uh, almost a million and a half dollars for pediatric cancer. But the city pays a price for it. And um, personally, I'm interested in looking into the fees versus, uh, you know, what they are right now, looking at the future and um, looking at the numbers, because that event does bring in a lot, lot, lot of money. Um, Paul, thanks for acknowledging, if you're here, the progress on building. Um, Permits are coming in more and more, and they're actually being issued. And we just, we need to continue to see progress, and we are. And I thank everybody. I thank the staff for, you know, making things as, as I don't know if I can use the word easy, 
as, as workable as possible and, and then pushing that work out. Um, Yolanda Bundy, thank you for being here tonight. Welcome to the city. Uh, I think you're going to find a lot of great people here uh, in our community and on the staff. And I, too, really, really appreciate the experience that you bring. Um, it's invaluable. And I will say that having met you a week or two ago, um, you just really come across as a person who values teamwork and has a hot, very high level of professionalism. You've got critical experience with what you've gone through with Ventura County and the Thomas Fire and their rebuilding. And from everything I can see, you work from a place of empathy. And I really appreciate that. Um, and Heather and Doug, thank you. Seven years of fun. Thank you both for what you do. You're both incredibly professional. Um, your jobs require a lot of uh, attention to detail, and you're the right people for that. So thank you. And here's to the next seven and maybe the next 27. So um, trying to make this quick a little bit about what I've done. Um, besides that county meeting, and again, that issue is one of the biggest issues here. We're going to keep working on it. Um, I did have the pleasure of attending the keynote lecture and the inauguration of the new Pepperdine. University President James Gash, um, he has been at Pepperdine for a long time already at the law school. Seems like an incredible guy. I wish him a lot of luck there. And it came up again and again in discussions I had with Pepperdine faculty and staff. Um, they want to have a stronger relationship with the city. And I'm all in favor of that. I look forward to that. Um, and I don't know if it was a coincidence, but I had been asked, um, and I just participated in a panel discussion held by a Pepperdine professor um, about women in local government. And anytime young people are invo uh, involved and interested in something like local government, I applaud them for that. It's not the most exciting subject in the world, probably to the average college student, but they have that level of maturity. So that was a great thing to be able to do. Um, the Homeless Task Force, thank you to Mikey, Susan. Thank you to Mike Trinan in the back. You're just deep in that trench, as deep as anybody. Um, there's so much work to be done there. I mean, it's 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 a nationwide problem, and maybe it's a worldwide problem. So we got to dig deeper. Um, Laco, down in Downey, excuse me. Um, we were just on the agenda, so everybody knows. We were on the agenda for a status update. That was like a maybe two-minute item at most. We gave them a status update of our... Uh, Negotiations with Santa Monica. Needless to say, that report was brief. Um, but those of us who stayed, which was pretty much everybody from the Malibu contingent, nobody from Santa Monica was there. I'll say, also say that. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Um, we stayed and, and watched the La Cañada agenda item, and they have, must have had maybe 30 25, 30 public speakers. Uh, they were very organized. Um, it was extremely uh, informative. Their issue is different from ours, or their issues are. Um, but procedurally, uh, it, was, it was really great for us that they happened to be on the same day. Um, oh, probably the biggest thing. I really want to thank everybody, paid, volunteer, self-appointed, uh, who got involved this past week with both the uh, announcement of the possible preemptive power shutoff and then the two fires uh, that impacted us um, with the smoke, uh, the Wendy fire and the Saddle Ridge fire. Um, I know I'm not going to hit everybody, but I really want to thank Arson Watch, starting with 
fellow council member, Mayor Pro Tem, Mikey Pearson, uh, all of our CERT team, the volunteers on patrol, Hans Letts and KBU 99.1 FM, all of the neighborhood fire brigades, um, everybody at the city, from our city manager to our public safety director, our media information officer. I know everybody was working triple time. Um, the fire department, the sheriffs. Uh, I hope everybody has signed up for alerts. If you haven't, hand me your phone. I'll sign you up, okay? Um, and uh, if you didn't pick up a, a respiratory mask at one of the distribution points, um, I just want to say that was a huge relief to know that those uh, are available and that I hope people uh, pick them up and make use of them. I mean, we just, we've had enough smoke in our lungs to last us a lifetime. Um, so that's it for my report. And we're going to move on to, oh, next thing. Uh, have any items, anybody pulling anything from the consent calendar? I'd like to just ask a question on 3B4. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar pulling item 3B4. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. And I have two public speakers on 3B4. Okay, so first up. Second that. Oh, excuse me. There's a motion second. Uh, this is to be a motion on the floor to approve the consent calendar without, um, without uh, B4. Thank you, Christy. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, our two public speakers on 3B4. First, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry, Reva. Staff report. Sure, I don't have a whole lot um, other to add, to add other than what is actually in the report, um, but the recommended action is to ask for the city's co-sponsorship of the annual Veterans Day celebration, which is Monday, November 11th this year, um, and uh, we would assist in the event uh, for a total cost of $4,400, which includes the fees for City Hall and associated staff to assist with that. Okay, thank you. All right, now, uh, our two public speakers on 3B4 are Dan Stark and Sophie Kidian. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to thank you, the City of Malibu, and uh, the, um, the event that we're having for the 20th year is coming up and we wanted to invite everybody in Malibu to come and in, we're going to be uh, honoring our veterans past and present and we're going to have great speakers, we're going to have some great entertainment, we're going to have dancers on your stage. So it's going to be the best year yet. So we just wanted to invite everyone to come and Dan, you have some things to add. Hi guys, I'm uh, Daniel Stark. I'm retired commander, 23 years in the Navy. And I'm on the uh, Veterans Day Committee again this year for I think this is my fifth year. And we're gonna be celebrating World War II veterans this year. And if you or any of your family wanna meet a World War II veteran, this is your chance and you won't have many more because all these guys are in, and, and ladies are in their 90s. And uh, so I think it'll be on Monday, the 11th of November. Hopefully we'll be here is where we were last time. Not last year because we got burned out, but year before. Uh, you mentioned uh, Jim Gash from uh, the University, Pepperdine University is going to give the benediction for our event that day. Uh, our Master of Ceremonies is uh, uh, Navy Captain John Payne, who is, some of you probably know, he uh, lives here in Malibu, and he's the chairman of the Navy League here in Malibu. So I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, it's a great event, and you're going to meet some really interesting people. Uh, uh, one 
I'll just mention a couple. One, one is uh, a friend of Sophie's. It's, it, she's a whack from World War II. She's 97, and she'll be here, and she's sharp as a tack, so she's probably going to be one of our speakers. We also have a speaker who was uh, in the Air Force in Europe and was shot down over over Germany in World War II and remained a, a prisoner of war uh, in Germany throughout the war, and he'll be one of our speakers. So I think you'll really enjoy it. Bring your families, your kid, your grandkids, your kids, everybody, and come and, uh, and celebrate uh, the greatest generation because they're disappearing at a rapid rate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We look forward to that. Okay, Mikey, go ahead. Um, thank you for that. That's going to be a great event. That's going to be great. I know my, my dad enlisted at 17. His mom signed some fake papers. I don't know what, and he went all the way to Okinawa and uh, somehow barely survived. So, yes, I, the great, great event. I was going to say, should we as add this to the yearly work plan under the hope that a group comes forward to do it so we don't have to agendize it every year? Would that make sense as it's 20 straight years? And you know, I, I don't know, I just want input on that. Um, we can certainly bring something back as part of the budget for the council to consider and uh, between now and then we can certainly work with some of the groups that have been involved and see what we can come up with. I'll make a motion to approve item 3B4. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are we now at 4A? Okay, we are now at item 4A. Mayor, I'm going to recuse myself from this item. Thank you. Okay, Skyler is recusing himself. Okay, um, we're going to take a very brief break. It's 8.11. Can we come back in, can we say seven minutes? 8.18, mark your watch. Thank you.
Mr. Gaines. We ready, everybody? Okay, we are back in session. We are on to item number 4A, the appeal number 19-002, appeal of planning commission resolution number 19-03-29043, Gray Fox, appellant slash applicant, Schmitz and Associates, Inc., property owner, John, and Tatiana Atwill, and this is continued from September 23rd, 2019. I have public speaker comments. So our first speaker is Don Schmitz, representing the applicant team. Mayor, Mayor you, yes. do you want a staff report first? Oh, I'm sorry, Heather, yes, thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, this item before you is the appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of CDP 17-043 and the associated request for a site plan review for proposed construction above the height of 18 feet. And to give you some background um, on this project, uh, the subject property is an infill lot um, located in the Point Doom area. Um, approximately one-third of a mile southwest of the intersection of PCH and Zumeris Drive. The property is developed with an existing single-family residence um, that's two stories and is surrounded by one- and two-story development. And the project site is directly across the street from Point Du Marine Science Elementary School, which has recently been renamed to Malibu Elementary School. The project proposes the demolition of the existing single family residence and associated development. Um, the existing development is a little over 4,700 square feet and includes the construction of a new two story residence um, at roughly about 7,600 square feet, which includes a 966 square foot attached garage roughly 650 square feet of covered loggias um, split between the first and second floor. It also includes the installation of a new septic system and associated development, including, including a swimming pool, landscaping, retaining walls, and grading. This image is a site plan that shows the siting of the proposed residence. The entire shaded portion um, represents the footprint of the, of the proposed house. Um, the residence complies with all required setbacks. It provides a full 65 feet um, front yard setback from, from Gray Fox Street and honors um, the required side yard setbacks. The shaded portion represents the two-story component of the residence. As you can see, it's clustered along the western side of the property, which is where the larger setback is proposed. Um, the residence al also proposes a setback from the stream at roughly 300 feet. That's to the north of the proposed residence. This image illustrates compliance with the two-thirds rule. Um, the two-thirds rule is a development standard for residential development. Um, it requires the second story component of a residence be no more than two-thirds the square footage of the first floor. And again, as mentioned earlier, the two-story component is clustered along the western side of the property. Um, and in general, the application of the two-thirds rule basically breaks up the massing of a building. So we're not looking at like a box. It breaks up. It kind of provides an architectural articulation of a proposed residence. 
And this image um, demonstrates the south-facing um, um, portion of the building, which is visible from Gray Fox Street. Um, as you can see, over over one half of the residents facing Gray Fox is um, 18 feet and less. And again, as mentioned, the second story component is clustered along the western side of the property. On the merits of this application, the Planning Commission denied um, the request um, at, a, at a three to two vote, uh, which differs somewhat from the attached resolution. The attached resolution um, of the Planning Commission denial represents a 5-0 vote, which basically demonstrates when staff brought the project back to the Planning Commission that we correctly summarized the Planning Commission's denial of the project. But during the actual deliberation of the CDP, the, the Planning Commission denied it in a three to two vote. And the denial was based on two findings, one finding required for the coastal permit and the other finding required for the site plan review. Um, as mentioned earlier, the proposed residence includes a request for construction above the base of 18 feet in height. And without the site plan review, the project does not comply with the LCP. Hence, the Planning Commission's denial of finding one for the coastal permit that the project does not conform to the LCP. The other, find, the other denial was based on the project's um, noncompliance with the neighborhood character. Um, the Planning Commission found that because of the project's size, bulk, and height, um, that it was significantly larger than the other um, existing development in the area and denied the site plan review request for consistency or compatibility with the, with the character of the neighborhood. The Planning Commission's denial was appealed by the applicant, who was also the appellant, and was based on um, two, two um, areas of contention. Um, the first of which that the, there is substantial evidence on the, in the record that demonstrates the application is consistent with both the LCP and the Malibu Municipal Code. Um, the, both documents uh, provide residential development standards that govern the size, bulk, and massing of structures. Um, some of these standards include height, height requirements, and inclu they include setback requirements, and there is a formula for um, calculating the maximum development square footage allowed on a property. After extensive review of the application, planning staff was able to find the project consistent with both the LCP and the Malibu Municipal Code, and has um, there's substantial evidence on the rec in the record that demonstrates this conformance. The appellant also contends that the Planning Commission's denial was contrary to law, um, and. Staff is aware that the, the, both the, the LCP and the Malibu Municipal Code, neither documents provide like a clear definition of what neighborhood character is. But in general, in planning principle, a neighborhood character, the neighborhood character is essentially what a person can visually see or what you feel when you're in a space. Um, but over the last few years, the Planning Commission, in their effort to assess um, neighborhood character, has asked planning staff to provide square footage information for residences in the nearby, um, within 500 feet of a project site. Um, staff, um, in an effort to provide data for the Planning Commission, has been relying on square footage information from the LA County Assessor's Office. Um, unfortunately, that because that, pro that information was accessible, we provided it, but it's flawed because it doesn't necessarily um, present uh, what the actual square footage is for residences in the area. So in lieu of that, um, the practice uh, up until recently has been for planning staff to assess what a person can visually see, like what is the bulk and massing of proposed development. Um, and, and coming up in a couple of slides, um, you'll see story poles that were placed on the project site that represent the proposed bulk and massing of the proposed project. Um, the, story, the story poles in conducting a visual analysis of the proposed residents and in comparing what you visually see and feel in the neighborhood, staff was able to find that the project is consistent with the character of the neighborhood. 
Unfortunately, um, during the Planning Commission's deliberation of uh, this particular coastal permit, they used the square footage information um, provided by the LA County's Assessor's Office and kind of used a sort of methodology which is similar to what the city has as a neighborhood standards process. Um, and if I did allude to this in a staff report, but the neighborhood standards process allows someone who wants to propose, for example, a larger residence than what the code allows, or maybe reduce setbacks than what the code allows. It allows a person to do a type of analysis of near, nearby residences to see if a proposed project is consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Um, this project does not include a request for neighborhood standards um, and was determined to be consistent and really inappropriate. The, the use of the neighborhood standards methodology was inappropriate for denying um, the coastal permit application. The next couple of slides um, show the placement of the story poles. Um, as you can see in this image, the red outline uh, roof line represents the highest point of the project site. And as you can see, compared to the residents um, immediately west at 29055 Gray Fox, it is consistent with the immediately adjacent property. Um, the project site sits at a slightly lower elevation and is also sited a little further back from Gray Fox. So although the square footage is larger, what you visually see is consistent with the adjacent neighbor, the development on the adjacent um, property. And this is an image looking northwest at the project site with a little portion of the neighboring re residents on the east. There we go, okay. Um, and again, as you can see, is um, relatively consistent with the development on the eastern property. And the next few slides um, provide a sampling of the existing development in the neighborhood. Here's an aerial photo um, showing Malibu Elementary to the south and the project site is identified here in white. And traveling a little, um, about 150 feet west along Gray Fox is a residence located at 29075 Gray Fox. And although the residence is, is smaller than this proposed project, this particular development is sited closer to Gray Fox Street. So what you, vis you see more of the massing of the structure because it has a reduced um, front yard setback. Traveling a little further west down Gray Fox, is another, Gray Fox is another residence at a roughly 1,200 um, linear feet west of the project site, located at 6900 Doom Drive. And as you can see, the, this particular development, there's a visual prominence of what you can see of the proposed pro, of this um, existing residence. And then another residence located around the corner at 6855 Doom Drive is, an, is another residence, which you can see there's a visual prominence of this structure because of the reduced setback from the street. In conclusion, staff has the ability to make all required findings for the coastal permit and the site plan review, the first of which the project does, is consistent with the Malibu um, local coastal program and the project is the least environmentally damaging alternative. And with regard to the required site plan review, staff is able to make all required findings, including the project's consistency with the neighborhood character. And there are a couple of findings for the site plan review um, in the Malibu Municipal Code that require consistency with the general plan and protection of scenic views from private residences. Um, staff is able to make all required findings for this, for this coastal development permit application. To date, staff has received correspondence from two sources, one of which is from the applicant and appellant who provided additional analysis to demonstrate the, or to illustrate the development pattern in the immediate area. There was also um, some additional analysis that demonstrates that there is substantial evidence in the record that the project is consistent with the LCP and the municipal code. And there's additional um, information regarding the Planning Commission's denial, um, that, the, that the Planning Commission's denial is contrary to law. This morning, staff received um, a letter of opposition from the neighbor immediately east of the project site. 
um, citing um, concerns regarding um, the incompatibility with the neighborhood character. And in the neighbor's correspondence, there is um, additional data regarding that provides square footage information of second story residences within five, 500 feet of the project site. And in conclusion, um, staff recommends the adoption of uh, resolution number 19-45, approving the subject coastal development permit application and the associated site plan review request. And this concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Renika. Thank you, Renika. Okay, Mikey, you have a question? Hi, Renika, thanks for your report. Um, what's, what is contrary to law? What, what, what were you referring to there? I was referring to the Planning Commission's deliberation on the project where they took, there's a, an attachment from the Planning Commission's um, agenda packet that includes a table of square footage information for residences um, within 500 feet of the project site. And in the Planning Commission's denial of the CDP, they basically took the square footage information um, and applied a similar approach to what one would use for a neighborhood standards request. Um, the neighborhood standards request allows the person to, so if the application was to exceed the maximum size of what the code allows, um, and taking square footage information for all residences, you take off the, the largest two, you take off the smallest two, and provide and do like an averaging process to determine if something is compatible with the neighborhood. But then that, that particular methodology is for a specific type of request, and that's not a part of this application. So was their, their methodology was, I understand using neighborhood standards is not correct in this incidence. I totally get that. That's flawed. I'm trying to understand what was contrary to law. Was their finding contrary to law or their process to get there contrary to law? The basis for the denial was contrary to law. Because you're saying they based it on neighborhood standards is why it was contrary to law? I think the, the um, project applicant could explain it a bit more. Their concern was that a different section of the code was being applied in the judgments that were being made at that hearing, that, the, the hearing that evening. Because I'm looking at the resolution, and the resolution says doesn't mention that. I understand that maybe they use that as part of their decision making, but I'm just trying to understand contrary to law because that finding two doesn't, it mostly talks about neighborhood character. Okay, we can go on. I just want to understand what you meant by that because, okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have public comments. Um, let's see here. First is Don Schmitz, uh, and this is the applicant team. I have two speaker slips, Don Schmitz and Fred Gaines. And I believe you have 15 minutes, is that correct? Um, and would you, would you like to save part of that time for the rebuttal? Yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to try and get through my presentation 10 minutes and save five minutes for rebuttal. And before we start the clock, um, would, uh, would Councilman Pearson let me to address specifically his question? No, we'll get um, to it. Okay, we'll get to it. That's fine. I was asking Councilman Pearson, City Attorney Christy Hogan. Thank you. She's okay. my legal representative in this uh, situation. Would you put 10 minutes on the clock before you start to run it, please? Okay, thank you. Don Schmitz on behalf of the applicant. Uh, you've already seen the project location. We'd like to point out a couple salient facts for your deliberations tonight. You have an average of, uh, and a mixture as accurately reflected in the staff report of one-story and two-story homes within a 500-foot radius of the subject property. Over half, 55% of the homes within this area are two stories. So more than half, so proposing a code compliant two story home is not inconsistent with the neighborhood character just as long as we designed it correctly, which I'll talk about more. Also, the code goes on to define a neighborhood on section 1740040 that if you have natural features that divide up the area in that 500 foot radius that you should not include that. So we have a canyon back behind the subject property, gray foxes on the left, Boniface is on the right. So if you take Boniface out of the equation, consistent with our code, 
uh, the mixture then changes where you have 54% of the homes, which are two-story, within the radius for the subject property. So the staff report does go on to say that you got this mixture of one-story and two-story residences, but Mr. Stockwell, who will be testifying to you, has stated in, in writing that he believes that it's mostly single-family homes within the neighborhood, which is not correct. Uh, Mr. Stockwell's home is two stories, uh, and two of the others are one story, and our existing home is two stories. So three out of the five are two stories. The immediate neighbor to the west of us uh, has wrote, written a letter of support, and she has a one-story home, and the two-story home component of our application will be closest to her. You've got an existing residence and a demolition plan, and this is what the house will look like pursuant to the story poles set back from the street. The two-story proposals located in the area of the house, which is currently two stories. The, the greenhouse burned down in the Woolsey fire. So here's the proposed development layout that you have right here, which is reflected in the staff report. And the area shaded in green of the two-story will be completely hidden behind the portion of the house fronting the street, which is in actuality two stories. The project complies with every aspect of the code for setbacks and permeable lock coverage, landscaping, grading. We have a discretionary request for site plan review, which candidly is consistent with most of the approvals for homes approved by the city. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Stockwell has stated that we're maxing out the development. We're not. Uh, the TDSF is 8,000 square foot. We're proposing just about 7,600 square foot. He states that the turrets and, and the bedrooms look right down on his property. First of all, the portion of the project next to his house is one story. It's 13 foot 9 inches setback, and currently the same size portion of the building is actually closer than what it is that we are proposing. So we're pulling this portion of the development back from his property. The turret itself, which is 28 foot tall, is 68 and a half feet from his property line. It is located... Uh, let me get to this part fast. 90 foot from uh, the tower to his studio that he has on his property. And as you can see, the vast majority of the second story will not be visible from the street. Oh, and by the way, it has no impacts on anybody's primary view as well. It's Mr. Stockwell's studio. We're 120 feet from his house, from the tower. As far as the master bedrooms go, we're 116 foot from his guest house, which is located below grade, as you can see uh, at the back part of his property, and 102 feet from his studio, which doesn't have windows facing our side, and 132 feet to the house. This design is not looming over, sorry, let me go back, does not loom over his residence. In fact, we went to great pains to make sure it didn't, and that's reflected in the staff report. Uh, as far as his property goes, uh, he did have a site plan review to have a, a second story, and he did have a minor modification to reduce by 50% the front yard setback. In fact, he has a 32 and a half uh, foot front yard setback. We have the full 65 foot setback, and the next nine foot is just one story. Until you get to the second story, we're 74 feet setback from the street. And of course, the second story from the street view will be buried and hidden behind the second story which faces the street. You literally will not see it. And this is reflected in the staff report as well in regards to the articulation and visual prominence and that we are consistent with the patterns within the neighborhood. So let's take a look at the building footprints. This is really important as it pertains to the design. Uh, again, Mr. Stockwell's property, he has a 32 and a half foot setback. That's the view of his house from the street. Our next door neighbor has a 44 foot setback. It's a beautiful one story house, but uh, much closer. You can see much more visible. And this is the view looking uh, across that property. And this is the story pole line from what it is that we're proposing. We're not going to be out of character with this neighborhood. The next house was a 29075 was a house that was approved by the county right before cityhood. It has a very nominal uh, 20 foot front yard setback. It's two stories. Uh, and it's at a higher elevation, so it looms over the neighborhood. And then you've got another one-story house at 29089 Gray Fox, which is a full 65-foot front yard setback. And it fits in very nicely. And we are going to be consistent with that neighborhood character. Three out of the five properties in this immediate neighborhood are already two-story residences. 
If you continue on the two-story analysis, the staff has made the findings. Uh, they went actually a little bit further than we did, but uh, they talk about how we have the full setback and the design and how we are sensitive in our design and consistent with the neighborhood standards, uh, excuse me, the neighborhood character within the area. Wow, that was a bad Freudian slip. So let's take a look at the 500 foot radius. If you, if you go over to Grasswood, which is technically within that 500 foot radius, you've got a two story house, 66% uh, of it is over, uh, over uh, two stories. You've got a one story house. And then you have two two story houses, uh, which are pretty significant. But if you take a look at them from an aerial photograph, they look quite dramatic. But if you look at them from the street with the enormous front yard setback, they're not obtrusive. They're not intrusive. They're not in anybody's face. Uh, right across the street from us, we have a school, as you're well aware. Incontrovertibly, that is part of the neighborhood character. And as you are aware, uh, very soon we're going to be building an additional 28-foot tall, 2,500-square-foot building right across the street from this this subject uh, house, which is before you tonight. If you want to continue along and, and take a look at Fernhill Drive, which is kind of around the corner, but it's technically within that radius, you've got a one-story house, and then you've got another two-story house. It's a, it's a real hodgepodge. Uh, not exactly the same neighborhood, but within that radius, you've got another one-story house. Uh, two more, actually, right there off of Gray Fox. And then on Fern Hill, we had an opposition letter from a neighbor who was distressed that they could see the story poles uh, from their property, which is located 500 feet away from the proposed house. So I imagine that they can see it, but I can see this house from my ranch up at the top of Latigo as well. I don't think it's going to be looming over their property. And the house that they have has a nice setback, 64 feet, and 60% of their house is two-story facing the street. And as you can see, it's a much more monolithic design than the very beautiful Spanish colonial design that we incorporated into the application before you tonight. So we believe that your staff is correct when they, when they issued an administrative coastal development permit and when they made the recommendation to the Planning Commission and the recommendation to you tonight that LIP section 13.27.5 site plan review findings that the project does not adversely affect the neighborhood character. So let's take another look at a couple very important aspects of it. That's the second story in the application, which is before you. These brackets represent the massing of the second story for the three houses that are going to be on Gray Fox. Mr. Stockwells is very de minimis. He's only got a 26-foot wide second story facing the street. Our next door neighbor, two lots up, is 110 feet wide. Okay. The uh, IT guys are trying to psych me out successfully back there. So they have two stories 110 feet wide facing the street. This is our neighborhood character. Either I'm having an epileptic fit or uh, we're having IT problems. The, the portion of this two-story home that will be visible from the street on the Atwill's house is only 45 feet in width. It's got a full front yard setback. It's tucked back in there. It's not looming over anybody, the immediate neighbors or the neighborhood. And I think demonstrably it is consistent with the neighborhood character. So accordingly, we do believe that the project complies with municipal code and all the LCP development standards. Three out of the five existing houses are already two stories in the immediate neighborhood there on Gray Fox. We have the full 65 foot front yard setback unlike the neighbors in the area, uh, including the largest house that has the most of the second story facing the street at only a 20-foot front yard setback. And we do not believe that the project adversely affects the neighborhood character. So uh, with that, I'm out of time. A whole eight seconds left on the clock. I'm available for any questions you have right now, and uh, we will be following up with rebuttal. Thank you. OK, thank you. All right, next we have John Stockwell. Uh, six minutes, as long as your uh, other uh, people who fill out slips are here. Casper, hello. David Ashwell, and Matthew, oh, Matt Palmieri. Hi, I don't recognize you with the hat on. Okay, John, you have six minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Hopefully I won't, I won't uh, need all six minutes. Um, my name is John Stockwell. My wife, Helena, 
Henderson and I live uh, 29033 Gray Fox, directly to the uh, east of this proposed project. And, and just to be clear, because this term was bandied around a lot, this is not a clean sheet project. It's not like the project that, that, that Don actually represented um, at 28837 Selfridge, where you approved his appeal. The Selfridge project had no discretionary request. It was entirely under 18 feet tall, required no site plan review. I would have no problem with that house next to us. It's a big house, but it's low profile house. It's, it's, uh, it's perfectly in keeping with the neighborhood. And this comes to a bigger issue, which is our objection has nothing to do with TDSF. Um, it has nothing to do with neighborhood standards. This is not a TDSF issue. Don, I, I noticed in this package has so many numbers on this house is this much square footage. It's not about TDSF. Our issue and the Planning Commission denial was based on the applicant wanting 3,073 square feet of habitable space above 18 feet. This requires a site plan review and a finding that the second, so second story footage does not adversely affect neighborhood character. The Planning Commission correctly determined that it does adversely affect neighborhood character. Nothing to do with neighborhood standards. <clears throat> um, and the many neighbors who have written uh, in, in opposition to this project agree. The average amount of habitable square footage in homes within the 500 foot radius is 702 square feet. Because they keep talking about the, plan, the planning department and Don say, oh, one and two story, as though two story if you have a 670 square foot art studio above your home is the same as having 3,074 square feet. It's, it's not, there's a big difference. And that's why you have this, uh, you know, this neighborhood character issue. Don wrote that the, the um, application of neighborhood standards provision to this project is arbitrary and capricious. Don knows that the dial is not based on neighborhood standards. This whole talk about unlawful, it's not based on neighborhood standards. It's based on neighborhood character. There's a major difference, he knows it. But they consciously avoid talking about the specifics of development above 18 foot in the 500 foot radius because he knows the numbers did not work in his favor. At the Planning Commission hearing, Craig Hill asked, do you want to delay our, our uh, vote until you are able to gather more numbers on the amount of second story square footage? And uh, he turned down that offer. Um, we were able to get the info on second story square footage from the tax assessors, the city of Malibu, our own plan sets, our neighbor's plan sets. Sometimes we had the neighbor's measures, sometimes we did. You know, he was able to, to overrule some of the tax assessor's information by saying he has a very competent staff who would do Google Earth and they would say, well, it actually looks like they have 8,000 square feet of TDSF. That same application could be done to determine the actual square footage as we did for second story. And now, this other thing that's irksome is, and I'm surprised that Don cited it today, but he keeps talking about the neighbor to the west of the project who is in support. And the planning department, when they concluded in her report that they wrote um, a letter from the westerly neighbor that approves of the design and agrees the project is compatible with the character of the neighborhood. Do you know who that westerly neighbor is that, that Don cited? It's the applicant's sister. And, I mean, I like Stephanie. She's a cool person, a good neighbor. In fact, she's been at the forefront of fighting the school and their development above 18 feet. And I'm sure it's a tough position to be when your brother is building a 28 foot high home next to you. But it's, I think it's wrong for the planning department, especially to have cited the sister of the applicant in their advocacy of, of approving the project. Um, and I also just want you all to remember that, because I was here for the TDSF reduction ordinance, and a lot of the people said, why are you just paying attention to TDSF? Why don't you pay attention to bulk and height and, and mass? Why are you treating you know, a single 8,000 square foot structure the same way as you treat four 2,000 square foot buildings that are spread out uh, on the property? Um, this project is exactly what people had a problem with. You know, a massive single 7,715 square foot home, 28 feet high, two story structure with 3,073 square foot of habitable space above 18 feet. And the reason for limiting height to 18 is because taller homes have a much bigger impact on a neighborhood. They reduce natural light, they reduce privacy, they impact views. And I know that, that Don is super confident, he knows because he advises these people in advance, hey, if you don't want to have a problem, you know, 
with the planning commission, with the neighbors, um, he probably would have done what he did with his clients in Selfridge and tell them, you know, if you're going to propose a house with this much amount of second story square, square footage, four times more than the average of second story of other homes in the neighborhood, then you're going to have issues with the neighborhood and the planning commission. We made our decision. We built a 674 square foot uh, studio above 18 feet because we did a survey with Doug Burge and we realized that the average number of development in the 500 foot radius was 702 square feet. So we made sure we stayed under that number. And, you know, that we went to, even then, we, you know, Holly was our planner. She said, look, you're way under the numbers, but you should go to your neighbors, show them your plans, work with them. Charlene, the old school point person said, get rid of all your windows. The reason you don't see windows on that side of the property is because Charlene wanted us to get rid of them, so nothing would be looking down. We said, okay, fine. And then she said, I want you to move your, your studio further towards my property. And we're like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you want it, okay, we'll do it. And we work with her. And, you know, that's the way all of Malibu should work, I think, you know. And, and I believe the Thank planning you, commission has taken a lot of heat for some misguided things. But I think in this case, they were using the neighborhood character argument and not the neighborhood standards. Thank you, John. Okay, we have one more speaker, uh, John Mazza. Good evening. Uh, it's very rare that I come and speak uh, about planning, and I'm not speaking for the Planning Commission, and I'm speaking only for myself. But when I read the staff report, it was so false, I had to come to you, because this is a big issue. And to make it simple, we learn our lesson. We use neighborhood character. And we had two, for example, we had two houses on Monday that were, one was four feet from the max, one was seven feet from the max they could build. They were over 8,000 square feet, but they were in Sea Star states. And we didn't go through a bunch of numbers. We drove around Sea Star states, and yeah, they're all big boys, okay? So that's neighborhood character. You don't need all these numbers. We get, Don's basically arguing that we looked at his numbers and blah, blah, blah. He just showed you a, a table that showed 23 houses in 500 feet. Doesn't happen on Point Doom that way. There aren't 23 houses in 500 feet. The average lot's 100 feet. So we get these spurious numbers from developers. We get a table sometimes from the staff, which we, is so inaccurate we hardly look at it. And then we discuss it. And if you would watch before these reviews, you can see we discuss, is this too big for the neighborhood? Uh, you drive down uh, Gray Fox, you drive down Fernhill, uh, you see all these 50s houses. They're all 2,500 square feet. And then every once in a while, Donna can pick out a house that's huge, okay? It was built by the county or blah, blah, blah. It's not the three houses next to anything. It's what is the neighborhood like? And we've been told, don't use neighborhood standards for a neighborhood character finding. We are required to make a neighborhood character finding. This, you cannot get a LC, uh, CDP without it if you have to, a site plan review. Staff can't give findings. You can, okay? You're going to have to say, we studied this, we studied this house in general, and we used an illegal method. But we didn't. So when you look at this, think, do you as a council, can you make a finding that's contrary to what the, the Planning Commission did by discussing how big this house was and what the neighborhoods were like and what this, how big the second floor was? You should think about that because you're the one to determine this. It's not coming from a table. It's not the average throwing out the top one and the bottom one. That doesn't happen anymore. And we learned, okay? This house requires that finding, period. You cannot give a CDP without it, and you have to decide that's true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Council members? Oh, I'm sorry, Don. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Five minutes of rebuttal. 
Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, Honorable Members. My name is Fred Gaines with the Law Offices of Gaines and Stacey, here on behalf of the applicants, Mr. and Mrs. Atwell, uh, who are here. Um, they're asking you, from a legal standpoint, to do two things. One, apply the law as it is, and apply it the same way you apply it to all the other residents of the city of, of Malibu. And if you do that, then you will deny, you'll overturn the uh, this case, you'll grant the appeal and approve the house because the house meets all of the legal requirements of the city and is and the, what you've done in prior uh, appeals, especially the appeals where the, your, your planning commission decided that the square footage was too big and they were going to come up with with ways to um, deny some projects while they were making a case to the council to change that rule. They've done it in several cases. This is one of those uh, cases. There's a discussion here today. Did they do this based on TDSF? Did they not do it based on TDSF? So we went back to the transcript, and at the four hour and 28 minute mark of the meeting of January 22nd, we all know we make really good decisions at the four, uh, the four and a half hour mark of our meetings, um, Commissioner Mazza made the following motion. So 3,500 square feet divided by 6,000 equals 58% bigger than the average house. So I will make the motion for denial based on the fact that more than 60% is not neighborhood character. It was a complete and total TDSF calculation. He said this house, under his calculation of the numbers, was 60% bigger, 58% bigger than others in the area, and therefore I move for denial based on neighborhood character. That's why it was contrary to law, because TDSF is on the chart. It met the, the qualifications of the chart. Then they went off into neighborhood character, which is not TDSF, it's other factors. But the motion was clearly based on the TDSF, which is exactly what they did in the other cases. Um, you know, I've cited to you uh, a number of legal principles, all of which go to apply the law as it is in the city. Even you, when you discuss this, said the applications that come through until we change the law, we're going to apply the law. And do fairness to this applicant as you've done to other applicants, and that's what we asked for in this case. Thank you very much. Could you stop the clock while they bring up my PowerPoint? Could you start it where you left off, please? Long, embarrassing silence. Go get it. Not going to happen. Problem. Okay, then. It's dead. Weeks and months worth of backbreaking, sweaty brow labor. Yeah, except the rebuttal's not in there. Um, okay. So um, I'll wing it. I've done this for a long time before they invented PowerPoint. Uh, so a couple comments, council members. Uh, this is a clean project in regards to it being consistent with all the development standards, there's no discretionary action except for the site plan review. We've never tried to hide that fact. And the precedent given by your staff in regards to projects that you overturned denials uh, by the Planning Commission were two-story homes that had site plan review. Mr. Stockwell cherry-picked and talked about the one-story home on Selfridge. But the fact of the matter is, incontrovertibly, Mr. Stockwell and my friend John Mazza are trying to rewrite history because I was at that hearing, I listened to their deliberations, I had meetings with them, and they are the ones that required your staff and me to give endless numbers, which they're now calling spurious, and, and I have a problem with that type of characterization, in regards to the size of the homes in the area. And they said quite unequivocally that they were denying this house, not because they did some concise analysis on the second story, but because they thought that the house overall was too big. And I'm glad that they've gotten the message now that this council's given a clear direction to them. But this was back in January. And back in January, that is precisely what the Planning Commission, or at least the majority of them, were doing. Uh, Commissioner Jennings and, uh, and, and Steve voted uh, to approve the project. 
if you can look back in your mind's eye and in the handout I gave you and you take a look at the design of this house and the second story. It would be one thing if the front part facing the street was all two-story, but it's not. The majority of the house facing the street is a one-story, 18-foot tall house. We have a narrow band, 45 feet wide, that's two-story, right? And then everything else back behind it is two-story, and you can't see it from the street. And we demonstrated both with aerial photographs, obliques, and pictures taken from the street that there are many, many homes just like this one within the surrounding neighborhood and many homes, including Mr. Stockwell's, which have significantly reduced front yard setbacks. We have a full 65 feet front yard setback and then the two-story portion of the house is set back another nine feet for 74 feet. So with that, I'm out of time. I wish my rebuttal slides were there, but I do appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, please uh, don't be bashful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, council members, comments, questions? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I met with Don Schmitz at the property. He asked for an appointment to meet with me and talk to me about it, and we were going to meet at City Hall, and I asked him if we could meet at the property itself, and he was gracious enough to meet me there. And we walked the property, um, and I was afforded the opportunity to ask all sorts of questions and actually get a ground-level view of the um, property. Um, so a question for, you know, I'm a former military guy, so one thing I did learn in the military is show me in writing. So I, I hear you, what you said in your uh, staff report, and I hear what they're saying here about the uh, application of neighborhood standards, but I'm looking at the findings, and I, I only have to see two findings that are here, finding a, finding two, or, you know, states, blah, 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 would adversely affect the rural residential character. I don't see, I see neighborhood character. I don't see any, any mention of TDSF, and I don't see neighborhood standards written anywhere. So am I correct in that? That is correct, um, but in reaching the findings, there was a lot of discussion about about square footage information, and um, there was an averaging process that was done to determine the consistency with the neighborhood character. Okay, thanks. Can I just jump in real quick? Sure. I just want to point out that you know you don't need to space spend too much time worrying about what the Planning Commission did because now it's in front of you. And so you have a de novo hearing, you take all of the evidence, certainly take into account the record of the Planning Commission, but also what you've heard tonight, and then make your decision based on the findings in the code and the planning staff can walk you through that. Make, make it easier. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to get some clarification on the stuff that was presented for this. You know, I, I listen to the report, I listen to the uh, appellant, I listen to the speaker, I listen to the rebuttal, I go out to the property, I do my due diligence, I drive around the neighborhood, and so I just want to get clarification on, on one of those aspects of information gathering that I use to make my uh, consideration of what's before me, so thank you for clarifying that. Um, the house with the, you know, you showed all, if you don't mind asking, the house with the 110 foot frontage, you know, where you showed all those profiles, that was the county house, right? <coughs> yes, sir, uh, through the chair. Uh, that uh, project was approved and built uh, under county permits uh, shortly before incorporation of the city of Malibu. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, when I drive around the neighborhood, and I look at these projects, I always try to find the thing that jumps out at you and it's like, what's wrong with this picture? There's one of these things is not like the other. And that was the building that stood out to me. I looked at that county building and I said, uh, this is from a previous era. And it's just, um, 
even though it doesn't really look that big here, it's definitely different than the other buildings in the area. You know, I drove all around Grasswood, and there are some two-story buildings on Grasswood that are kind of interesting because the street level view is the second story. You know, they're two-story houses, and you drive by their super low profile. Not all of them, but, uh, and even they're building a new one on Grasswood, and it looks to be a one-story building. And then I was impressed with the fact that the house on either side of this property, the the craftsman style one, I don't know if I'm using the proper expression, maybe it's arts and crafts. The layman's expression is craftsman. Looks to be a new house, or certainly a new remodel. I mean, it's in great shape, and that's a one-story building. And um, uh, the other house on the other side is a one-story building with that one art studio thing that's coming up. So I was impressed with the fact that there are some relatively new buildings that have gone into that area that are one story and ones that are being built um, that are one story. So when I looked at that and I drove around the area before I met you and after I met you, and in today I went back out there and just did a general reconnaissance of the whole area, I definitely got the impression that everything was a little more low profile and that one county building did kind of stand out as like, it's, this does not fit in with the neighborhood. So um, that's, it looked to me like the property is um, certainly large enough to do a lot of different things on it. And I was just, um, anyway, my impressions were that everything out there is generally low profile. Yeah, there's some, there's some outliers that are bigger than the others. When, and, you know, it's funny because talk about what does it look like from the street. Well, you know, that street goes up. And then it also, you go up it and you go down it. Mm -hmm. And you can see a little more of things when you go up or down. So it's not all just ground level. Anyway, those are um, some of my comments. I, I don't see any, me personally, have, see any compelling reason uh, in the presentation that we've got to change the uh, decision of the Planning Commission from what I saw going out there and from what I read as their reason. But I'd like to hear what the other council members have to say, and I'll withhold my final determination until I hear what they have to say. Okay. Um, let me start with disclosures. So I have... Um, as a planning commissioner, I visited this property, met with the Atwells, and um, did a tour. I think I was with uh, Steve Uring at the time. Um, so, been to the property extensively back last year, whenever it was. <laughs> Seems like a long time ago. Um, I've talked with John also about this project. So there's my disclosure. Um, I know you wanted to meet Don, but I didn't know if I was going to be able to. I took a while for to hear back whether I was going to be able to hear this because I was also part of the planning commission, which brought it asked to bring it back as a full CDP. But that does not disqualify me. Apparently, I have discovered. I, I think this is the kind of, as a planning commissioner, certainly this is the kind of part of the code that drives me insane. And I think the house in Selfridge was a great example. That became a real battle, that 8,000 square foot house, the single story one that John mentioned, which I voted for because its bulk to me was exactly what you want to do with a house. That house just disappears. And I thought it, I would I say, I hadn't heard John say that before. I would, that would be to me, neighborhood character that makes sense. What is different here that wasn't discussed really in the staff report, but certainly was at the Planning Commission, was how large the second story is. And that, that is notable. So here we come to this thing I hate. I like, I'm the way my brain works, I like things you can measure and are definable really easily because that's clean and neat, and I like that in development. It's really like, okay, it makes it or it doesn't. And that's why I hate neighborhood character, but it's exactly why neighborhood character exists was this project, <laughs> because it's 
a neighborhood character project, 100%. I think, this, from what I can read, just my impression, the staff report misses what I viewed at the Planning Commission, that a lot of the discussion that came out counted to me was there was stuff that was off base, whatever, but there was stuff that was about neighborhood character. And the finding clearly, as I mentioned early, finding two only talks about neighborhood character. So how do we judge neighborhood character? I mean, that's the magic question there's no real answer to. And to me, every everything else that we're talking about here, all the other stuff, it's it all comes back to neighborhood character. Um, and that's what we should be focusing on. Um, saying that this house conforms to all of our reg all of our rules and codes and regulations it is sort of true, but the way it was said nullifies that we do have this neighborhood character thing. And I'd love to change neighborhood character to something that could be more tangible. But this isn't a project that I guess why it was put in there. Um, I think the Planning Commission went about this in an odd way. Some of their discussion and some of, uh, I, I would not necessarily agree with item one, the way it was worded. Finding two, I find myself in a tree situation. I'm supposed to now define neighborhood character, I guess. And I don't think, as we sit here, I have the data to overturn their decision on that item. Item one I do, and item two I simply don't. It's definitely, as was said, is not a TDSF issue. It is a neighborhood character issue, and I don't know if I know the perfect answer, but from what I've seen so far, I have not really seen a project in a long time that I felt I don't think I've ever personally voted on a neighborhood character issue as being a reason to deny. And I don't know if this came to us fresh, if that, how I would vote, but looking at this appeal, uh, at this point, finding two, I have trouble overruling that. So that's how I feel right now. Jefferson? Thank you. Uh, my disclosure is done. I missed you uh, at the office. Um, I was on a job. Um, I have not spoken to John Stockwell about it. I did read his letter. I have visited the site twice, as late as last night, I believe, um, on my own, unescorted, without trespassing. <laughs> so as I drive up and down the street, um, I make my own impression, so I call myself clean sheets. I don't oftentimes follow the Planning Commission with its rulings because I like to look at it with a fresh approach. And I had no difficulty with this product. I know it's it's product to a lot of people. But it's your home. And I understand that and your passion and your feelings in it. And um, it's a large home, but it does meet most of the standards. I get that. I understand that. For me, the trouble with the project was that there's 3,000 square feet on a second floor. And the neighborhood standards, neighborhood character, I kind of look at that like, okay, you've got these definitions. I read Fred Gaines' uh, letter about it's a taking. I mean, I go through these things and I try and look at it as logically as I can. What's right down the middle with this thing? And for me, if the upper floor were 12 or 1300 square feet like the other homes in the neighborhood, I'd probably be going, done, sign, slam, build. But that whole second floor is twice the size of everything around it. And for me, that's a difficulty. And to permit that and to say, here it is, the next person says, on Gray Fox, you gave him 3,000 square feet on the second floor. 
And for me, I just can't go with that. Once again, if it came back and the second floor was 12, 1,500 square feet, I, I'd be voting for the project. Right now, I just can't go with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I drive by this area all the time because I live not too far from there. Um, the first thing I have to say is I'm extremely troubled by some remarks made tonight that the staff report is, quote, so false and so inaccurate that we can hardly look at it. I don't want to be on a council. I certainly don't want to be the mayor of a city that is generating false staff reports. So let's clear that up for starters. Renika, can you tell me again um, that you said there, what you said about there were no legal grounds in your report? So as... Um stated earlier during the Planning Commission's deliberation on this project, um, there was a lot of discussion about average sizes of homes. And this particular project being um, above the average as a basis for denying the project based on neighborhood character. Okay, thank you. You know, I think it's worth noting that the setback is 65 feet, um, whereas some of the surrounding setbacks are half that and definitely has a visual impact. Um, I also consider a huge part of my job here is to keep the city on legally defensible grounds. So... Would anyone like to make a motion? And if not, I will. I'd like to ask a quick question that, that you brought up, uh, directed to Christy. So are we supposed to make our findings here based on <laughs> conversations we're not necessarily privy to at a planning commission or based on the findings? Because what we're presenting here... I'm not exactly here, sure what that was. It sounded loaded. Okay. Uh, well, no, no, no. I just, it's a serious question. It's not it's meant here, to be loaded. The, the, so the, the, we've the, had a lot of talk about what happened at the planning commission, but then we have our report right. and the report has findings. Right. So I'm used to making decisions based on findings, but it right. seems to be a lot of energy in right. the room on potentially talking about what. Right. And I was, I wasn't there. Right. I did view part of it. Right. Okay. And I if that's it. supposed to be part of our decision, then. That's what I'm curious about. Right. So in public hearings, this one, no exception, you're going to hear a lot of irrelevant things because, you know, it's hard not to just raise everything you can think of to either support or oppose a project. So we know that. What your job is, is to sift through everything you hear and identify those pieces of evidence that would help support the findings that are required. So the ones that you're looking at tonight for example, um, the one you seem to be talking about the most is that the project adversely affects neighborhood character. So the evidence you have has to do with the size of it and its setback, and those are the numbers. And then you have to make a, a qualitative judgment and analysis of whether or not that, those facts would result in an adverse effect to the neighborhood or not. Yeah, I'll make a motion. I'd like to make a motion to deny the appeal. I second it. Okay, should we do, uh, Don, excuse sure. me, can we do this? Madam Mayor, may I Madam make Mayor, a sir. quick uh, request? I'm hearing uh, concerns about some of the information, that there's not enough information. Uh, we definitely uh, believe in this this uh, council uh, as opposed to walking out of here with a denial I'm certainly prepared 
to uh, work with your staff to see if there's things we can do to tweak this to garner the favor of this council. Additionally, there's a point of fairness that I am concerned about. Uh, we received the data from Mr. Stockwell. It was emailed to me at 3.34 o'clock today. I've not had the opportunity to check those numbers as it pertains to the second stories. I've heard comments from a number of council members that that's an important issue to them. So my plea to the council tonight would be if you can put this off, allow us to work with your staff, clarify the numbers, see what we can do here to address some of the concerns we've heard. We've never been in a position where we're trying to ramrod this. We do want to work with the city to get something done here. Okay, so are we tabling so, this? No, well, his request is um, for a continuance, but the issue is that if there are changes that are going to be made to the project in order to respond to the concerns, it really should be heard by the Planning Commission first and then maybe that would get resolved so my suggestion would be either you vote on the motion that's on the floor or um, if you want to consider an alternative it would be to remand it back to the planning commission to consider any revisions that the um, that the uh, applicants want to make but I you know that's that's what I would suggest. I'm, I don't know what I mean. Continuing it, I don't. The staff doesn't really have the authority to negotiate a different design that isn't also seen by the planning commission. That's just our process. Okay, thank you. So we could uh, move forward with uh, sending it back, um, honoring Don Schmitz's request to give us a second whack at this. Which sounds like what he's saying is. He's going to bring some more numbers to support this project, not a redesign project. So I want to clarify that. No, that's not, that's not what we're saying. We heard the comments and we agreed. Okay. In the interest of fairness, since Don got to speak, John, go ahead. I just, I just want to just say that if this is coming back to you, you may want to. Procedural only. You, yeah, you may. You may I want to really you. be careful what you say if you want okay. to participate on this. If you deny the project, it will come back to us as a new submittal. Right. Um, the issue is uh, has to do with the, the fees that they pay and the time that they invest. And, you know, if they're, if they're like this really ends up being a question about the square footage of the second story, do you really want to send them back to the beginning of the queue and pay a bunch of fees all over again? when you know you've got fire rebuilds that you're trying to push through so but you also have a staff that has to work for free if you do that okay so council we have a motion on the floor or we can make a new motion and this can go back to the Planning Commission I would support making a new motion let it go back to the Planning Commission. Do we have a second? I would second that that motion. So just to be clear, um, the substitute motion that's on the floor is to remand this back to the Planning Commission on the applicant's representation that they intend to um, redesign parts of the project um, in light of what they've heard tonight. That's the motion. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. This motion passes, then we're done. If it fails, then we'll go back to the motion to deny. Okay, Heather, you're clear on that? Okay. Do you want a roll call or do you want to? Um, yeah, let's do roll call. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Yeah. Making sure it meant the right thing. Oh, okay. Yes to go back to the planning. Planning Commission. Good, okay. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Mayor Ferrer? Yes. Motion carries. Need someone to get uh, Skyler? Or Skyler, are you out there? Okay, Skyler, there you are. All right, our next item 
is 4B. Okay, thank you. Uh, an ordinance to prevent, whoa, careful. Trespass in the very high fire hazard severity zone. May I have a staff report, please, Susan? Yes, hi. So yeah, we are presenting to you tonight um, a recommendation to adopt an ordinance to prevent trespass in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Cal Fire and LA County Fire have <clears throat> recommended and designated the city of Malibu to be part of a very high fire hazard severity zone, which does enable you to close off certain areas of the city when uh, the fire chief deems that it would be in the best interest of public safety. What this ordinance does is help us with a current situation that resulted from a year ago when there was a lawsuit with the Boise versus um, Martin, where they essentially made it difficult to cite anyone for camping on public property. And since that time, the LA County Sheriff's has not been able to cite people for camping. Um, last month, City of LA found a way to try to deal with this, and they passed an ordinance to strengthen the ability to cite people for camping if it was clearly in a dangerous fire hazard area. So that was passed, and we were watching because we wanted to make sure that it could, you know, withstand legal challenges, and so far it looks to be good. So we are modeling this ordinance on their ordinance. And the key difference is that right now we can already post to keep people out of high fire hazard severity zones when there's fire danger. The big difference is in terms of noticing. Right now it's more just based on signage and posting. Um, what this ordinance will allow us to do, we'll also be able to do verbal notifications because, you know, obviously you can't put a sign in every single area and someone could argue, well, I didn't see the sign. Um, and then it just makes it more difficult to remove people. So this ordinance allows to be able to give deputies to do a verbal notification that, you know, this is a very high fire hazard severity zone and you need to leave, it's trespassing. And essentially they would have the power to arrest them for trespass on public property during these times. So if we adopt this, the next um, step would then be to put together implementation procedures, which would also probably be modeled on City of LA, because we don't want to come off as looking like we're trying to criminalize homelessness and punish people who have nowhere else to be. We want to be very clear that we're really uh, more interested in enforcing these rules when we're having red flag, when there's Santa Ana's, when it's clearly a public safety threat to everyone involved. So that would be, you know, put together in the implementation of how this is enforced. Thank you, Susan. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Where, in that situation, do we have a thought on where the sheriffs will ask the individual or individuals to go? That's part of the implementation one. That's part of what we have to figure out. And even more difficult than that is what do we do with their stuff? Because sometimes they'll have a lot of stuff and figuring out who's going to be responsible for removing it, who's storing it, um, how is that going to be handled? So that's kind of the next step. Um, but first we need the ordinance and then we'll put together the implementation guidelines working with the Sheriff's Department um, to make sure that we have a workable way of enforcing this. Okay, thank you. All right, we've got a few public speakers. Um, I will call you, and if you can please try to come to the front to save time in between. Danielle Harrington, Marina Sangit, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your last name, Georgia Goldfarb, and Rosie Strickland. Hello, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Danielle. I'm a student at Pepperdine um, School of Public Policy. I'm here tonight to speak, obviously, on item 4B. Um, my initial reaction to this was a lot of concern just for the Malibu homeless population. Um, so I hope that if this is to move forward, that in the implementation phase, um, you really take consideration of those people and um, where they're going to be displaced, where they're going to go. I, that was my first question as well. Um, and then not only that, but 
trying to continuously make sure that they are safe in these times, um, especially with like the Woolsey fire and everything like that that had recently happened. I, I guess I'm not familiar with how you communicate with those types of populations in an emergency situation. Um, so I hope that those things are considered in the implementation of this. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Next is Marina. Help me with your last name. I thought we were going to take them to the dorms at Pepperdine. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Marina. Marina saying it. You saying got it. it. Thank you. And then Georgia Goldfarb and Rosie Strickland. So good evening, council members and mayors. My name is Marina, and I, too, am a graduate student up at the School of Public Policy. Um, I specialize in state and local policy, but I'm really interested in social welfare policies as well as crisis management. So when I read 4B, which is this ordinance that the city is putting forth, I was really excited that I believe the intent is to save, and pr to save human lives and prevent the loss of human life. Um, I think I want to echo my colleagues' concerns in saying that during the implementation phase, if this ordinance does pass, that the council takes a really thoughtful and mindful approach on what happens to this homeless population and if there's any routes for them um, in terms of displacements, are there resources that they can be connected to if they are asked to leave. Um, once again, I do want to thank the city council and the mayor for thinking such thoughtful and proactive um, policy making actions and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Marina. Georgia Goldfarb, followed by Rosie Strickland. Good evening, council members. Um, I am uh, uh, wanted to speak to address an issue of, of uh, not against this proposal, but for it, but uh, concerns about uh, camping. Um, I had a recent experience at uh, near my property uh, where a private property, private residential property, was advertised on hip camp. And um, it caused, uh, it's right on the edge of a very steep chaparral canyon. Um, it was, uh, it was made possible because the, it had been graded a long time ago. And so they took a tiny corner of that and um, advertised it on hip camp. So um, there were campers coming up. Um, there may have been a stove. There was a tent with Christmas tree lights on it. And this property is not, um, you can't visually see what's going on on the property unless you actually go up to the end of the property. So any supervision by um, any, you know, neighbors or, you know, sheriffs uh, is difficult to impossible. So after many phone calls, not really knowing which property it was, um, uh, we finally figured out that it was um, an undeveloped property, and uh, I don't even know if the owner actually gave permission um, or if the person was just assuming that they could do this, which apparently, according to the sheriff, does happen. Um, so the long and the short of it was there were a lot of people up there in an unsupervised area, and... Um, you know, on private property, trespassing across other people's property, right adjacent to a partially developed house, um, which I thought was pretty risky. So um, now one of the property owners put up a big gate, and that's really slowed it down. Uh, after multiple conversations or communications with Hip Camp, they took the posting down, which of course helped. But I have to say, all the traffic up there and all the campers, uh, all the hikers, and campers was a bit disconcerting, especially when some of the people were told that it was private property and please don't trespass. And they said they really didn't care. They were going to go up there anyway and accept whatever legal consequences were present. So I just think that, uh, you know, I think that's a risky thing. And I realize that isn't exactly what you're addressing, but I just wanted you to be aware of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And our final speaker, Ms. Strickland. Thank you. Yes, hi, my name is Rosie Strickland, and uh, good evening, council members and mayor. Um, I appreciate this chance to speak, and uh, I'm just going to, I know there are always a lot of legalities and things that need to be addressed and considered very seriously, but I'm just speaking directly to you. I've lived in Malibu for over 40 years, um, 
minus uh, one or two years when I had to move out because we lost our house in the 93 Malibu fire. So when I um, think of how vulnerable Malibu is, I just really want to um, beg this council to do whatever is necessary to keep our whole community safe. It's just um, such a crucial issue. And uh, if people are camping, say, in the Big Rock area and a fire starts, it's not just Big Rock that's um, going to be impacted. You know, it's an entire uh, community of Malibu that's threatened. So we really need to take this so seriously. Um, and I appreciate uh, all the time that you spend in really helping to make our community safe and um, doing everything that you can to um, address any issues of vulnerability. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, Rosie. Okay, Council, anyone have any comments? I'll get a start on it. Start to the right, go to the left. Uh, the LA ordinances and um, the follow-up on that was because of what was going on in the Sepulveda Basin. And that actually impacted at those two fires that they had in the basin, it actually impacted some of the homeless people that were unfortunately having to camp there. And I get that. Another response to this was because of the four homes that were lost next to the new Getty Museum. So there's kind of a response here coming about by community leaders outside of Malibu when they recognize that the situation is difficult to deal with, but the, re the resolution has to, to happen where we take care of our homeless, but we also have to respect the property owners and the welfare of those homeless themselves. So I wish the Pepperdine students had stayed behind so that we could bring and open the dialogue with maybe a place to take some of these homeless on the red flag days that the sheriff could help these people on a beautiful campus that survives fires and has 5,000 students, vibrant, healthy, ready to help the homeless. And maybe we could work on that program with the university. Um, and if the students had stayed, they may have been able to move that forward at their level. But for me, I like what we're trying to do here. I know we're getting into the weeds uh, with implementation, but I'd like to see us move forward on it. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Mikey, anything? Oh, I, I think this is a necessary step in the right direction, absolutely. I, I thank you for bringing this forward. Um, it's important. We have so many things to figure out, and this is just another piece of the puzzle that we need to add, uh, balancing a lot of different priorities, so thank you. Thanks, Mikey. Skyler? Thank you. Um, well, Christy, I, I just don't, I'm a little bit unclear on how the whole Boise decision came down and what the legal ramifications of this will be. And I know that the city currently doesn't have any facilities or place to take these folks to in the event of this, so the implementation of it kind of concerns me, and I'd like you to shed a little bit of light on that. Well, certainly we're not going to um, implement it in a way that's illegal or unconstitutional, so that would be the goal. Um, and there are some resources and resource agencies that the city can partner with so that there, you know, is a place. I think the idea is it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, within a one-mile radius of where a person's staying, but there, you can't um, push somebody out who has nowhere else to go. And so as long as there are available beds and resources, then um, it's a lawful, I, we believe, a lawful restriction given we're balancing against the high fire hazard. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any comments. I support it. I'd like to make a motion to, um, what are we doing this? Passing this? Accepting it? Introducing it. Introducing it. I'll second. So, Madam Mayor, the motion on the floor is to introduce on first reading an ordinance of the City of Malibu, California, amending Chapter 8.12 of Title 8 of the Malibu Municipal Code to 
to add provisions for very high fire hazard severity zones and finding the same exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Thank you, Christy. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 With a little bit of legal reservation. <laughs> that was an aye, yes, Skyler? Yes. Thank you. All right, moving on to the final item, 7A, and that is subject is district-based city council elections. That is council member Peake's uh, item. And uh, do we have a staff report? Uh, I can give a little bit of a brief report on this item, and I, I know that Christy helped with this. Um, so I thought that it would be a you know, a good idea for our council to look at seeing if whether or not we want district-based elections in our city. Um, I think that we've often fought for, you know, people to have the best representation uh, when it comes to electing people to the council. And I think that this is a way that sort of spreads out that representation uh, throughout the city and makes it so that any area that probably wouldn't feel as represented right now may feel uh, better represented in the future. And it kind of coincides, I think, a little bit with where we, you know, made an issue over the school board, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, understanding that a lot of other cities have been pushed legally um, to have district-based elections. And in each area uh, at this point where they have... Um, try to stop that from happening, uh, continue to lose repeatedly in court to the tunes of millions of dollars uh, fighting those cases and are then forced to have district-based elections. So maybe it's a little bit uh, premature because we have not had one of those lawsuits filed here, um, but I brought it forward um, after <coughs> seeing I guess what has happened in a couple of our neighboring cities, most recently, I believe Santa Monica, um, which is not listed in there, but they're I'm probably gonna come down with a significantly higher uh, fiscal repercussion uh, based on their opposition um, and being forced to have district-based elections. So curious to hear what our public speakers have to say. Okay, thank you, Skyler. Um, our first speaker is Kevin Shankman, and it looks like you have one additional minute from Matt DeNicola. They weren't bundled, but I see that on the slip. Okay, and then we have three other speakers after that, John Mazza, Carl Randall, and Jennifer DeNicola. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, me and my law firm are actually responsible for the vast majority of the what Schuyler described as the legal pushing, um, including Santa Monica. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Peake uh, for his consistent um, advocacy for fair elections in Malibu. I think it was five years ago that uh, Schuyler came with uh, moving the election date to November of even years to increase turnout, and, and that passed, and I think everyone on this council was elected uh, in November of an even year. Um, and this, too, is just bringing Malibu's city council elections into the 21st century. Um, I perused the staff report, and it has a lot of pros and cons about at-large and district elections, and some of it I, I agree with, some of it I don't. But I don't think that anyone who has lived in Malibu for any significant length of time needs a list of, of it needs a list to know the fundamental problem with at-large elections. Prior to being incorporated March 28, 1991, this city was a part of the behemoth of L.A. County, and because of our size compared to the size of the county, this city lacked representation, lacked effective representation. More recently, Mayor Ferrer, you ran for school board in, Santa, in the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, and though you prevailed mightily in within the city of Malibu, in Santa Monica not so much, and therefore in that election our three Malibu residents running for, for school board all lost because of the at-large election system. To say that that problem with at-large elections 
doesn't exist within the boundaries of the city of Malibu, I think, would frankly be naive. Malibu is not a homogeneous community. Malibu has horse properties in the west and houses right on top of one another in the east. Incredibly expensive, beautiful homes on the beach in the south and more modest homes, even apartments in the north. And those, those different groups have different interests and only through district-based elections can those interests be adequately represented. And, and that's not a slight against anyone in this council. I think everyone in this council does the best that they can to represent all of those interests, but oftentimes it's difficult. In the, in the, in the city's history, one person, one council member in the, in the entire city's history has lived east of Paradise Cove, where half of the population lives. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the school board petition. Um, whether you can come up with some nuance as to why it is consistent to have at-large elections for the council, for the city council, and yet the, the thrust of the petition to, the, to LACO is about how Malibu doesn't have representation because of the at-large system for the, for the school board. Um, the way that that will be viewed by LACO and the way that that will be viewed by the State Board of, Equal, of, of Education is simply, a, is simply hypocrisy. Not necessarily that it is, but that's the way it'll be viewed. Um, and, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Sorry, next up is John Mazza, followed by Carl Randall, followed by Jennifer DeNicola. Uh, I just want to say I, I totally disagree, and I think you should talk to Christy a lot about this because we don't discriminate racially, economically. We're a homogeneous community, and I cannot imagine anybody suing Malibu because we discriminate against certain areas of our city. It's We don't have a barrio, okay? And... There are big problems with electing people. Now, he just said only one guy got elected east of so-and-so. Well, there's a guy named Lou Lamont. There's Sharon Borofsky. There's a bunch, okay? What you need in this town when we have elections is you need qualified candidates. You need people who actually care, not because they're just in a district where, gee, nobody's going to run against me. Now, one of the problems with Malibu, or one of the things that's important with Malibu, is to act as a group, to be Malibu. And, and you know that people in Malibu pretty much have the same issues. There's two sides, but they're pretty much not divided by, you know, whether you live on Point Doom or Big Rock. And the downside is, for example, what election have we read a slate? You can't do that anymore. You will not be allowed. You will never have a general election where the citizens all go out on the same day. You're going to advertise in the paper, come out and vote, but by the way, Skyler, you can't vote because you're in Point Doom. You're not in that district. Uh, you, ha you have a one media town. You have to advertise in the whole town, not your little district. Uh, you have a lot of problems of getting the best representation on the city council and having a force that is cohesive. You don't want somebody going out and picking, gee, I have one little issue for Big Rock or one little issue for Malibu West. I'll run on that, and those people will vote for me, so I'll be, I'll be the councilman. You have to look in, at yourselves and say, when I got elected, did I consider myself from Malibu or from Point Down? Did I consider I was going to be fair to the population? There is no chance of anybody winning a suit of us discriminating under the, this law. There's no chance. And, and I think Christy will tell you that because we don't have those disparities in Malibu. There's a lot of other reasons not to split the city up into little tidy spec. We're talking 2,000 people you know, to vote. I mean, all of a sudden, you have to represent 2,000 people. We split from Santa Monica or the county because it was 13,000 against 14 million. You know, it's not 2,000 against the other 2,000. And I really hope you look at yourself and say, gee, I liked running as a slate. I, I liked campaigning for the whole city. I liked representing the whole city. 
Thank you. Thank you, John. Next up, Carl Randall and then Jennifer DeNicola. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, from the East Side Barrio, and uh, I just came tonight. I just really want you guys to think about this item. It's somewhere between John's many people from the East Side and Kevin's one. I counted five since we've become a city in 91. Between Larry Wan, Lou Lamont, both Borofskis, and Mike Cagiano, I counted five out of maybe 50 council members who've been this side of Paradise Cove. So it's a pretty important number. And you know, I'm looking at the dais and I see zero from my side of town. It's not usually an issue because I figure you know, 80%, 75, 80% of the decisions this council makes are citywide stuff. But there are things that are in the neighborhood that have impact that would be better, better represented by somebody who lives in the neighborhood from the crosswalk at La, at La Costa that took 10 years because it was not focused on. Whereas there's a right turn lane at Trancas that I don't really care about because it's 15 miles from me. So, but it's for you and for the people in that neighborhood, it's the end all be all. So I get it in those portions. There are things citywide need to be done. Um, do remember, before we became a city, this is how the Malibu Township Council went about their business. They did it by district. Do recognize, as Kevin said, that our petition to LACO is by district. I think there's some serious pros and cons on this one. I just want you guys to really weigh in and really think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. The last speaker is Jennifer DeNicola. Hi, everybody. Um, I think this is a really important thing that you guys need to consider. Um, I think that moving forward towards district elections, for many of the reasons that Kevin talked about, some of the reasons that Carl talked about, um, there are plenty of people in each of quadrants of what, 2,500 that we've broken apart that are qualified to sit on this council that have value to add to you know be here and help Malibu. I think it's a lot easier to um, have a closer relationship with 2,500 people than it is to have a relationship with, you know, about 13,000. Um, and I think that's really what a represent, you know, representation is all about is having that personal relationship that you can call up your council member. Um, and not that all of you guys, people can't call up. It's just harder when you have 13,000 people than 2,500 people to really focus on. Um, the other thing, you know, it lowers costs for people running. There's lots of benefits to doing it this way. The other part of it, too, is, um, you know, something John had said that is not necessarily accurate. I apologize, John, but um, the intent to discriminate is not an element to prove a violation of the law. So just because, you know, not that I think that we have a homogeneous population here, but that is not one of the elements to decide whether or not we should have um, elections or that legally we're required to have those elections. So I really think this is something that you guys should push forward, do a lot of research on it, figure it out, but it is the way, um, I think it's what's in the best interest of all of Malibu, let alone you know being the most democratic choice. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have council member comments? Yeah, comment. Um, I'm, uh, you know, when I look at our beautiful town at 13,000, it's a small town. It's a, it's a pretty small town. It's a big area, but it is a small town. It's only 13,000. And, you know, we're going to go to this um, League of California Cities conference, and you realize you're kind of a single-celled amoeba town <laughs> when you do run into some of these other places. I mean, we're not like Thousand Oaks. We're not like Glendale. And that's kind of cool in a way, because even when I go to the, the school board, you know, the, the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District School Board, I realize, you know, we're, we have pretty good cohesion here in this town. And I think that's, that's important. When I look at our community, I think we should be doing things that enhance our cohesion and not divide us, whether it be by voting districts or anything else. And I, I that strikes me as a bit of balkanization. I heard Kevin's comments about, hey, you know, you really have to, you know, how can the people from one area really, I mean, I'm not paraphrasing what you said, but if, you know, if I'm 
I'm, if my, let's say I live in Ramirez Canyon and, and I'm in a boating area that includes Point Doom and now I'm a little peewee guy compared to Point Doom, you know, so I'm, you could say that even in my little voting district, maybe I'm, I'm uh, a little subset. And you can make that argument throughout our whole town. Our whole town is 21 miles long with a bunch of little uh, unique and different neighborhoods. And I think that's kind of cool. That makes us different. But we're all one town, and I think we should do things to enhance our cohesion. I'm not dogmatic about this, and my mind isn't closed on it. But I don't really see any compelling reason to do it. And, you know, when I ran for city council, it was good for me to get out and talk to all the different neighborhoods and hear what everybody had to say. And when I come up here, I don't, I don't think I bring just my Ramirez Canyon mindset to everything. I, uh, I'm here to support the mission statement, which I think applies to everyone in Malibu. And fortunately, we are kind of one little single cell to me, but we don't have like the industrial area and the business area and the sports arena area. We're mostly a residential town with a modest amount of commercial activity. We do have some unique characteristics in that we have zillions of visitors who like to come here, and that does make things different. But we're kind of a single cell amoeba, and I think that's one of the things that's beautiful about our town. And I, um, for me, I don't see a compelling reason to do it. But I'm, I'm open-minded, and I want to hear what other people have to say. And I could be sold on it, but I'm just not sold yet. So that's my comments. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else? Um, I, I, I would have to say I'm pretty much where Rick is. Um, I've lived in every single part of Malibu at some point or another from, you know, the very end of the city near uh, Topanga to Big Rock to my family's been in Big Rock since the 50s to all the way at the West End to Point Doom to everywhere. So and it, it's an interesting I, I understand the concept very well, in theory, <laughs> I didn't practice, and, and something Rick said was, was right, I mean, during, campaigning was very interesting, um, and since then, too, I'm, I'm at meetings everywhere, at Tuesday night is uh, Big Rocks having their meeting, um, Terry there, and I don't know, I, I like one thing that was great about running for city council is being connected to the entire city. I really love that. I love, and I've never ever thought of my neighborhood as what's important or key. But with that said, I know there's more to this than I have learned about, and I'm open-minded too. Um, I don't know. I worry. I guess my worry would be, and I don't know if it's right or not, that people would get elected that do only care about theory, and that would be a tragic. I mean, it's really great to have people that do care about all of Malibu, and maybe that doesn't change, and, and this is a very new idea to me, and I've read every bit of this. So um, at this point, I'm, I'm kind of right where Rick is. Um, I do look forward to learning more at some point, and I know it looks like this would be a lot of work, and so if we want to do it, I wouldn't even know how to get it on our work plan right now because that's totally full as we're constantly reminded because it's true. So, but at the same time, there you go, what Rick said. Thank you, Mikey. Jefferson? Thank you, Karen. Um, so Skylar and I have had the honor of serving the community uh, for two terms. So we're, we're the uh, senior members here. And, Curiously, when I was on council the first term, 2008 to 2012, I spent most of my time with the East End, researching the issues and the problems that were East End. I spent a lot of time getting the road open, $3 million road. I was involved in that from day one. Scott Dietrich was one that was pushing it. We were the ones in, on my council that got the left turn lane at Big Rock with a signal. Uh, I know that crosswalk's been a tough one, but we're there uh, and we're moving forward with it. But Mikey and I went about a year ago 
and had a discussion with some of the people on the de on the dewatering. And I know Mikey's new. I had already had some expressions and some education on it. And we informed that community at the East End so well that they finally activated and started questioning some of the authorities of the research that was being handed to them that they're paying for. And that worked out very well. And we didn't think of it as East End or Mid City or West End. We thought about it as our community. And I look at my community in my second term, and whenever I was mayor running the show, I started it out with from Topanga past Trancas, from Ridgeline to Coastline. That's the area I serve. Breaking up the areas, to me, may be an advantage at some points because I read the pros and the cons, and I like these kinds of discussions because nobody's going to be offended. We're trying to do a better management of the city. For me, if you don't get out and know that the right turn lane at Trank is, is never going to happen, and I started on that when I was at my last term, and we still don't have a crosswalk at La Costa, these are the issues that we deal with, but we know all the issues. Right now, the issue for me is mid-Malibu trying to get a crosswalk underneath PCH at the restaurant. We need a whole community from both ends to make that happen. We need 13,000 people that think alike to make sure that crosswalk goes underneath PCH and not in, on top of the highway. So I appreciate this. The effort and Skyler, I appreciate your exploring it. And you have come up with some terrific things in the past, and I've always supported them on that. But on this one, I, I'm kind of a neutral kind of feel on it. It's like, kind of like, gosh, I thought we were all one community. I, I'm going to continue to feel it's one community for my last year in office. And hopefully, we serve you the way we're supposed to as a community. And thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, I've been aware of this issue for a long time um, through my work with school district. Uh, a lot of things uh, that the school district has considered uh, and now being on this end and having worked on separation for 10 years. Um, I'll say this for my personal history. I started out on Rambla Pacifico, two miles up, um, from 1978 to 87. It was nine and a half years, and that's in the county. Uh, we obviously weren't incorporated as a city yet. Um, I then moved down onto PCH, a few houses uh, west of the La Costa Crosswalk. I lived there, coincidentally, for nine and a half years. And I moved to Point Doom in November of 1996, and I still live there. I haven't seen for myself a big change in my perspective of how I see the city. Um, the issues are the issues for all of us, uh, whether it's traffic, public safety, fire risk, uh, all, all of the issues that we've all campaigned on, talked about up here on the dais, um, I, I see those as all being my concern, regardless of where I have lived. Um, and I will say, for the current school board, I think everybody knows there are seven school board members. If we did have... Um, trustee districts, that would give us one vote for sure. Technically, it would give Malibu one and a half votes. So I don't know. It seems like maybe sometimes we'd have one guaranteed. Sometimes, I, I don't know, we might be able to squeeze out two. It would never be a majority. Moving forward um, with a Malibu school district, I don't know. I think that's worth considering at that time. Um, but what we have right now, less than a year after the fire, 
is a huge project ahead of us um, with hundreds of permits that have been submitted, hundreds more that are expected. Um, you know, the city has hired additional staff. Uh, we've, we've brought in people to help with information, with getting those permits issued, with all the planning issues that go along with that. Um, and I feel like this is such a significant shift in our system, and it, it would require a lot of staff time. Um, I don't think this is the right time to do this. It might be in the future, but I think right now we've got a huge row to hoe, as they say. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, the city's maxed out uh, in, in capacity, in the workload, and in the budget. And I just think this is the wrong time for us to go this way. So um, that's what I have to say about that. Um, Mayor, if I may, um, I understand that council does not want to do this at this time. Uh, just in regards to staff time and the process for making it happen, I don't think it would be a significant impact or cost to staff, just for the record, based on going forward with that process. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'd like to add one comment to some of the uh, people east of Civic Center. You do have a representative here, <laughs> right? I'm less than a half mile from here, so I'm your East Ender. Come talk to me. Do we have a motion? Yeah, I have a motion. I'd like to have a uh, make a motion to receive and file this possible consideration at a later date. I'll second that. Okay, can we do a roll call vote? Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Peek? Negative. Mayor Pro Tem Fair? I mean, Pearson, sorry. Uh, yeah, yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. I move to adjourn. Thank you. And Mayor, we're adjourning to October 28th at 4 p.m.? Oh, correct. Uh, our next meeting, October 28th, will begin at 4 p.m. And I'll be calling in. That'll be charming. Thank you.